Mackerel. Please, my lady, my yes, lord. This is an appeal against decisions made by Mr. Justice Moston sitting in the family court in his reserved judgment dated the 17th of October 2022 and reflected in an order sealed on the same day. The judge dismissed the appellate's application to rescind her decree nisi and granted the respondent's application to make the decree absolute. My Lord Lord Justice Moylan granted permission to appeal on the 2nd of December and at the same time he stayed the judge's orders so that the decree nisi is not to be pronounced until the determination. With Mr Viney, I appear on behalf of the appellant, Hi. Olga Kazalet, but known as Angela Jelina. She's the lady sitting behind. And to whom I shall refer, if I may, as the wife, as she was referred to below and in the judgment. She is, of course, still the wife, and Mr Abu Zulaf is still the husband, um, but their marriage has yet to be dissolved. My other friends, Mr Molyneux, King's counsel, and Mr Bennett, appear on behalf of the respondent husband, Mr Walid Abu Zulaf, and he's the gentleman behind. I trust that your ladyship and your lordships have received the bundles in electronic paper format, whichever was your preference. Yes. Um, and also the position statements that were before the judge below that, that, that you requested. We have, for which thank you. And we've all had an opportunity of reading the judgment, uh, the skeleton arguments, and uh, dipped into the relevant authorities. Very great for my lady. Um, it's my intention, subject to your ladyship's and your lordship's direction, um, firstly, to make some relatively brief opening remarks, just to put this appeal in the context of the history in which it arises, um, and to explain the consequences of the appeal, if allowed. And then I'll move swiftly to address you on the grounds that we raise on this appeal. We, we raise four grounds, my lady. Ground one, that the judge erroneously formulated the test to be applied when considering a rescission of decree nisi. This, we say, encapsulates a consideration <laughs> of the test when deciding whether to make the decree absolute to a very great extent, and certainly in this case we say the same considerations apply. Ground two, that he incorrectly applied the test, and ground three, that inevitably as a result he arrived at a flawed, at flawed evaluative assessments, which led him to concluding in error that the evidence in the case did not furnish the conclusion that the inferential evaluative findings made in 2013 uh, were wrong. Gr ground four is our public policy. I agree with my learned friends in their section G of their skeleton, that in essence ground one, grounds one to three are part and parcel of the same thing. Yes. Uh, which is, of course, if the judge made an error, then he, he made an error in, in applying yes. it. Um, in, in fact, I'm going to identify during the course of my submissions eight key findings of fact in the judgment um, that will, in my submission, enable your ladyship and your lordships to exercise your discretion afresh if the appeal is allowed. Um, I intend to address my submissions in the following way. Firstly, to address the power and the nature of the power that the judge was being asked to exercise on the applications before him. Secondly, to address what principles should apply when exercising that power and what factors should and should not be taken into account. I, I will do so by reference to the intention of Parliament and the decided case law. Uh, as to the latter, I will be submitting to your ladyship and your lordships that there is a clear distinction between the jurisprudence decided before 1969 and that decided afterwards. In my submission, those cases decided before 1969 under the legal regime of matrimonial offence, condemnation and revival are in inapplicable and inapt in the present case. Um, my Lord Lord Justice Moylan, when granting permission to appeal, raise the question of whether the older authorities may be relevant, and I intend to address that as part of, as part of my submissions. As part of that discussion, I will be referring to the test as formulated by Mr Viney and me in our skeleton. That's at paragraph 28, page 88 of the bundle. And I will then examine the principles that the judge did apply in this case, his test, and which considerations he omitted to apply, and thereby falling into error. And finally, as far as I've not already done so in the course of my submissions, I will address the court on where that leaves the case and explain, as I've just said, how the judge's primary findings of fact can and should, we say, be fitted to the correct test to enable you to make the orders we seek. We are not, in case that wasn't clear, we're not seeking a rehearing, no. um, not just because the hearing was an excoriating experience, although for everyone, although that is true, um, but because we say it's not necessary. 
Um, learned friends have raised as a preliminary issue the principle in Patalis and Grant. Um, they are going to hear all the arguments. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very grateful, my lady. Um, and then I say, if, if Mr. Monu wants to uh, pursue that, um, we'll of course hear his submissions. Um, it, it's fair to say that some of the response I'd intended to make in response to the Patalis point um, may also be relevant to whether my lady and my lord have sufficient material, whether there was sufficient evidence to exercise afresh, but I'll, but I'll come to that in due course at the appropriate moment. Um, I, I'll, I'll move on just to, just to some more, small matters of housekeeping before, yeah. before, I, before I get on with it. Um, I've agreed with my learned friends, and again, subject to the direction of the court, that in terms of timing, I'm roughly I'll take, take the morning, perhaps a little less, it, whatever it depends, and then Mr Molyneux will take the afternoon, and any time that's left, it, brief reply if, if necessary. Certainly. Um, my next housekeeping point is uh, concerns my agreement with Mr Molyneux um, that we don't intend to identify the party's minor children. Um, the judge did make a reporting restriction order at first instance confined to not, not naming and identifying the minor children. Um, neither party wishes to identify the children. We haven't made a formal application in line with my lady's judgment in XW and XH. But, but we, so we, so the, our skeletons have redacted the names and we don't intend to refer to the children other than by initial. Thank you, my lady. No, that's obviously correct. And my final housekeeping point is, is an apology. Um, we've discovered a glitch in the appeal bundle. My lady and my lords may also have noticed it. Um, it's, it's, in, it's in the appeal bundle at page 54, which is part of Mr. Justice Mosson's judgment. Um, you will see a rogue hard return has crept into paragraph 36 of the judgment. Yes. Um, it doesn't really matter, save that it means all the subsequent paragraphs are now misnumbered. So it may be that some of the references in our skeleton to paragraphs in the judgment may be one <coughs> amiss. But where it matters, because I'm going to, at the, at the conclusion of my submissions, come to address my lady and my lords on what we say are the operative paragraphs of the judgment, 57 to 60, it may be that I just have to admit there may be a bit of jumping around, so I apologise so, for that. Not at all. Thank you very much. Mm, very grateful. Um, I'm going to then address my brief opening remarks. Um, this appeal arises between this husband and this wife who've been in a, in a relationship since 2001. They have a 17-year-old son, G, a 9-year-old daughter, A, and an 8-year-old son, J. G and A are the biological children of the parties. J is the adopted son of the appellant. And, and as the court knows, all three children are children of the family. J was born and adopted after Decree Nysai was pronounced in this case. Uh, indeed, after the financial remedies order was made. The financial remedies order was made in June 2014. And he was born in November, unknown to either party, and adopted in July 2015. The husband and wife married in 2012, separated in 2013, and in, in September 2013, the wife petitioned for divorce on the basis that the marriage had irretrievably broken down, and she, she sought to satisfy the court under Section 12B of the Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, her statement of case as pleaded in the, in, the, in the petition is in the bundle. My lady and my lords may have, it's at page 224. We might come to that later. And the court duly pronounced the decree on the 12th of September, District Judge Walker, 2013. Um, since then, neither party, for a period of more than eight years, sought to terminate the marriage by applying for decree absolute. And the husband only applied then in January 2022 in response to the wife's application to rescind the NISI. During that exceptionally long period of delay, the parties have remained married. Whilst the hearing was taken up, with much factual material that was disputed, a, a series of, we say, significant, significant events occurred after pronouncement of the decree in ISI that were either the subject of primary findings of fact by Mr Justice Mostyn, with which neither party seeks to interfere, or were, or were common ground between the husband and the wife. Um, there are eight key facts which we have identified, and I would like to list them now so that my lady and my lords have them in mind during the course of my submissions. Um, we have, to save the judicial pens, reduced these to, 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 to a small table, which we've circulated to learned friends. Wh whether now or, or, or later, um, we can circulate that table. Mr Molly has no, no objection, which, whichever is convenient. Well, we'll have it now. And yes, we'll thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's my intention simply to identify these facts now and later come back to um, examine in more detail how the judge de dealt or in fact didn't deal with these facts and what import that has in, in terms of his um, error. 
Um, I'll take them relatively swiftly. Um, one, the fact that Jay was adopted by the wife after Decree Nisi, treated by both parties as a child of the family. Um, in terms of timeline, as I've just said, Jay was adopted in July 2015, 20 months after Decree Nisi, eight months after the parties resumed their relationship in November 2014. Neither party applied to make the decree absolute for eight years. Three, there was a finding that the husband was violent prior to the petition, but there was no finding or assertion that he was physically violent after the petition, certainly not after Decree Nisi. The husband accepted that there were sexual relations after Decree Nisi, indeed for a period of five years until 2018. The husband accepted that the parties holidayed together. The parties referred to each other privately and to the world publicly as husband and wife. They were drawn back together about 12 months after the making of the Decree Nisi and resumed a relationship in November 2014, which ended in March 2020. I, I accept that Mr Justice Mostyn described that relationship as toxic, damaging and unhealthy, although we say that was his evaluative assessment of the quality of the party's relationship and outside the parameters of the way in which he should have been approaching the questions on the applications before him. And finally, um, there was no actual cohabitation after Decree Nisi, but they nor had there been beforehand. These are parties who had never lived together. There was no change in that regard. As I say, I'll come back to those eight key facts um, later to, to examine why and how the judge went wrong. The consequences of rescinding the decree and dismissing the petition for, 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 for one will surely follow the other will be to confirm without any shadow of a doubt the appellant's status as wife throughout the period and with it the status of J and indeed A as children of the family. We've made the technical point in our skeleton argument that the children in this legal context, namely the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973, only acquire their status by the, mean, that the meaning, the definition in, in section 52.1, and I quote, in relation to the parties to a marriage. The Children Act is actually drafted in, in exactly the same terms. Uh, and it's part of our case that there, that has to be a family of some substance, not just, not just the, the technical legal status. It, it was a key part of the appellant's motivation in bringing her application to rescind that Jay should be recognised by the husband as a child of the family, and that was rightly conceded, um, albeit very late in the day at the commencement of the final hearing. It, it's also the case that the financial remedies order made by Mr Justice Mostyn in June 2014 will fall away, uh, and that was made at a time when, when Jay simply couldn't feature in the judge's consideration because I mean, he didn't exist at, at, at that stage. The husband has not fully implemented the financial order. Could we, could we just pause here for a Yes, bit? of course. Um, I don't think you've given us, have you, section 52? Um, my lord, um, no, forgive uh, me. Quite a, quite a lot of the statutory provisions are, are, are not there. They're easily accessible. But, um, but so far as... The argument seems to be that it's accepted that, that Jay is a child of the family, but not a child of the marriage. I, I read that somewhere. He, he, he was treated as a child of the family, but 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 uh, well, maybe for Mr. Molyneux to, 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 yes, to explain that the, the 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 but that it, that was not. Um, I mean, the answer is I don't know. It's his argument, not in relation to the marriage. And we say that in this context, the definition only arises in relation to the parties to a marriage. So that's what, what the terms of Section 52 say. Well, I'm just trying to see whether that... I, 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 I believe it may be in our... I'm sure it's, it, it's quoted elsewhere, but just so that we look at the actual um, text of Section 52. <coughs> Um, it's, it's reproduced um, in full, my lord, in our skeleton argument, um, if, it, if that's more convenient. Paragraph. Paragraph 54, at the very top of page 97. In the, page 1279 of the Red Book 2022. And you'll see in our skeleton, we, it's, it's our emphasis added in relation to the parties to a marriage. Thank you. 
in other words, my lord, if, if these parties had at all time been unmarried, say the decree absolute had been pronounced before the adoption, this definition couldn't apply. But it does apply because there was a marriage. And we say that cre creates the anomaly that if the judge was prepared to accept the concession that this child was treated as a child of the family in relation to the parties to a marriage, that should at the very least have, have, have been something he considered very carefully before discarding it when he came to his considerations. A very basic question, but the only way you become a child of the family is via the marriage of your parents. That, that, my lord, yes, and that's and that definition also applies in the Children Act at Section 105. We haven't we haven't given it to my, to my lord. We can find the reference. A, and indeed, um, absent marriage, it's simply not possible to fall within that definition within this legal context. That requ it requires a marriage. I mean, quick query, since Jay was adopted by one party to the marriage, um, whether or not by virtue of Section 1 of the Family Law Reform Act 1987, because the adoption happened, that, that the husband would have had parental responsibility, it doesn't really arise on this appeal, but it may, seems to be quite an interesting point, that you may have had parental responsibility, but this is concerned with the financial consequences within the meaning of the Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, so, so, returning then to the consequences um, of, the, of allowing the appeal, um, the, the financial remedies order would fall away, the husband has not fully implemented the order, there remain lump sums that have not been paid. The wife, of course, has not been able to enforce um, the order without decree absolute, she has not sought to do so, because during the course of the past nine years, she was still married, she considered herself to be married. And until the party's relationship broke down in March 2020, the husband supported her financially above and beyond the terms of the old financial order. For example, he was paying Jay's school fees. What, what, if a decree was set aside, what happens as a matter of law in relation to orders made thereafter? They, they, they simply fall away, my lord, the, the, because it's a prerequisite for there to be an order for financial remedies that a decree nice has been pronounced. The order doesn't take effect until decree absolute. That's why it was not, not enforceable. But, but the, the, the legal basis for the, for the order would fall away and it would simply evaporate, for want of a better word. What happens to part performed orders or performed orders? Well, they, they would be, they would, they would, there's nothing enforceable in any event, say for child maintenance, which isn't dependent upon decree absolute. And what would happen is my client would issue a fresh petition under the new regime, the Divorce and Dissolution Act 2020, on her application. And there, and there would be a conditional order pronounced on her statement that there's an irretrievable breakdown now and the court would exercise its discretion afresh. Uh, and of course, within that context, there's the prenuptial agreement, and, and the terms of that are operative. Um, but, but we say that the, the consequence would be that my client's financial settlement would be based on a marriage that endured for 10 years, rather than the two years to which she's confined under the current regime. Would it, would it follow that um, the fact that a certain amount may have been paid previously um, is a fact that is then taken into account. Uh, oh yes, in, in reduction. Uh, uh, oh yes, undoubtedly, my lord. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, the, 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 those facts as presented to, <coughs> I suppose it wouldn't be Mr. Justice Mosson because he, he's due to retire. But but the the terms of the prenuptial agreement are such that there's a certain amount um, payable on, on a sliding scale depending on the duration of the marriage. Um, the amount that's provided for housing increases by about 1.7 million for a marriage of approximately 10 years as opposed to the two years. And so the, the sort of on account, the money that's been provided, that would count towards it. In terms of maintenance, they're periodical payments anyway. So, so that's sort of water under the bridge, and those periodical pay payments would continue at a, at a higher rate under the regime, under a 10-year marriage. But it, but it wouldn't be that those parts are forgotten and the husband's given no credit for them, if that's what I understand my Lord's question to be directed at. Thank you. Uh, the judge below characterised this dispute as being about money and only money, and at paragraph 51 of our skeleton we highlight the obvious flaws in that statement, because marriage is about a lot more than that. This case is also about the wife's status and the status of Jay. Um, anyway, there is nothing morally undeserving about the appellant's wish to seek a fair financial settlement within the terms she signed up to in the prenuptial agreement, but based on the true length of the marriage. 
We've already made a point in our skeleton that it was unfair of the judge to turn his fire on my client and not in equal measure the husband in that regard. Well, presumably the husband was equally focused on the money. Uh, my lady, quite. That's the point we're making in our skeleton. He, 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 sauce is, for the goose and sauce for the gandy, that, you would that, say. That's exactly the point we wanted to make. Um, the final point I'd like to make by way of opening um, remarks, really in passing, is to address the relevance of this appeal under the new law, under the Divorce, Dissolution and Separation Act 2020. This appeal is governed by the old law, the provisions before the implementation of the DDSA last year, which brought in finally true no-fault divorce, um, as made in my Lord's no. Um, the ground is still irre irretrievable breakdown, but it's not necessary to prove one of the five facts as before. And the court um, must take the statement of the applicant as to be evidence of irretrievable breakdown. So we've, we've, the, the, the laws come the full, the full sweep from matrimonial offence with no subjective element to subjective element, irretrievable breakdown, and one of the five facts. And in relation to adultery and behaviour, there's, there's an internal subjective element to both those, those facts. Now it's simply the subjective assertion by the applicant that there's irretrievable breakdown. The two stages of decree have been preserved, um, as we, we both address that in our skeleton arguments. And um, the, the court retains a discretion whether to make the conditional order, order final or not in certain circumstances, including, like in this case, where it's the respondent and not the applicant for a divorce order who applies. And procedurally, now under Rule 7.18, current family iteration of family procedure rules, the court still requires an explanation in cases where the application is made after a delay of more than 12 months um, uh, as to why the application hasn't been made earlier. Uh, we raise these points to highlight that even though there's been a change of legal regime, the principles under review may have some relevance under the norm. I'm going to move on to the power and the nature of the power. And I'm dealing with matter in this way because there's a difference between the approach we say is correct Namely, that when considering an application for decree absolute and or to rescind the decree, the court re-examines the constituent elements of the decree and satisfies itself that the decree is sound, whereas the judge and Milan and friends urge on the court um, that the, 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 the high hurdle of set-aside has to be surmounted. It, it comes from a, from a different position, and we disagree about the nature of the task. Um, there were two operative applications before the court. Firstly, the first in time was the wife's application to rescind under section 31 F6 of the Matrimonial and Family Proceedings Act 1984, by which the family court has very wide powers to rescind and replace orders. That's not my lord in the authorities bundle, but it is reproduced in full in Mr. Justice Moston's judgment at page 52 in the appeal bundle at the top of the page. When you're dealing with them, um, I'll just say when you're dealing with the judgment, could you refer to paragraphs? But I that would be difficult. Um, Page yes, it's, I, 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 my lady, I'll endeavour to do so as, as, as no, much as I can. No, don't worry, I'll manage. Thank you. Um, secondly, second in time, was the husband's application to make the decree, abs to make the decree absolute under section 9.2 of the Matrimonial Causes Act, which enables a respondent to a divorce petition to apply for decree absolute in circumstances where the petit petitioner has failed to do so, the three months, six weeks and a day. Under that provision, the court has the power to make the decree absolute, rescind, require further inquiry, or any other order that the court sees fit. So um, both discretionary, but both the powers are discretionary. I, 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 I think it is uncontroversial for me to say that. Um, we say that even though the application, applications were advanced under separate statutory provisions, the essential task that the court was engaged in was part and parcel of the same thing. Um, the, heart and the, the heart of the matter on both applications was that the wife was asserting the basis of the decree nisi was unsound by reasons of events that occurred after it was pronounced. Um, we agree with the judge that whilst discretionary, it's more aptly described as a structured discretionary exercise or an evaluation. And we agree that it will be an error of law for the court to conduct the discretionary exercise other than by reference to the appropriate principles whether by application of, a, of irrelevant or inappropriate considerations, which we say the judge did in this case, measuring the test against his own formulation of what a functioning marriage is or should be, or equally it will be an error of law um, for the court to, to omit to apply relevant considerations. 
such as in this case, being satisfied of the reasons for the delay, because Parliament specifically requires that. Under the, under, under the divorce law enforced between 1969 and 2022, the sole ground, as I've just said to you, my lady and my lords, was irretrievable breakdown, but the fact had to be proved. This appellant relied on the fact that the respondent had behaved in such a way that the petitioner cannot reasonably be expected to live with him. At no stage, whether on this appeal or below, has the wife sought to set aside the primary findings of fact. The husband's behaviour complained of in 2013 took place. What she sought to set aside is the evaluative assessment that it was unreasonable for her to be expected to live with him. And moreover, that was in light of subsequent events. And of course, um, the family court is um, very familiar with using actual knowledge of subsequent events to inform an historic evaluation. It, it, just in the financial remedies context, my law, Lord Justice Moylan has, in a number of judgments, um, observed um, about the wisdom of embracing subsequent knowledge of a company's performance, for example, to inform an historic evaluation of. of. And yet, as I'll come on to, this, this was a task that the court felt uncomfortable with in this case. Um, a behaviour petition requires those two ingredients, not just the respondent must have committed the behaviour, but that the effect on the petitioner was such. <clears throat> the wife also challenged, and that was what the wife challenged, she also challenged the evaluative assessment that as at 2013 the marriage had broken down, but it was accepted by the time of the hearing that the marriage had broken down for different reasons. Um, as we've explained in our skeleton, whilst both ingredients are required, there need be no causal link between them, and that was addressed by um, the Supreme Court in, in, in Owens. I don't need to take my lady to it. I don't suppose these propositions of law are remotely challenged by Mr Molyneux, but they are of the utmost importance in my submission on this appeal, because it's only by reference to those necessary elements for there to be a decree that the judge could properly have reappraised re the soundness of the decree in light of their subsequent events. The overarching error that the judge fell into was, with respect to his experience and learning, to approach the rescission question uh, failing to consider those constituent elements. He approached it in a very one-dimensional way, and he relied very heavily in his judgment on the authorities decided under the old, the old law, now the old, old law, um, pre-1969, which, which never required those subjective elements. They could never, could never be of assistance to his lordship um, in examining them. Um, I said a moment ago that the, that the judge was plainly uncomfortable um, about the nature of the exercise he was being asked to undertake, and I, and, I, and I derived that from paragraph 38 of the judgment, which is at page 54 of the bundle. <coughs> Where he's this is just this is just after the rogue hard return, in fact, where he's considering the, the, the different routes to, to, to set aside. And he talks about section 9-1 of the Act makes clear that the showing cause provision is not available to the parties, um, with the abolition of the impediment of collusion, and so on. Um, he says, however, halfway down, as will be seen, case law says, somewhat illogically, in my respectful opinion, that subsequent facts arising after decree and eyesight are also admissible in determining whether a decree should be rescinded. Um, the, the first mistake that the judge makes in this paragraph is that he is, he is blinded, in a sense, by the position under section 9-1, which are cases where it's the king's, queen's, now king's proctor um, intervening. Um, that um, part of the statute is at pages 182 to 183 of the appeal bundle. Oh, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, my lord. Um, the, the terms of paragraph one, subparagraph one, are, are drafted in permissive terms. Um, the king, Queen's Proctor, King's Proctor may show cause by reason of material facts not having been brought to the court. It, it does not direct um, there in the statute that the decree shall be made absolute unless there are material facts. It's, it, it's permissive, but, but, that, but that language creeps into the judgment as I'm going to go on to develop. Um, and in so doing, the judge sets the bar too high. 
Also, in relation to this paragraph that I've asked my lady and my lords to look at, section 9.2, subsection 2, um, is, is unrelated to subsection 1, save that it, uh, the court has the same range of powers available to it. Subsection 2 concerns the application by a respondent. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, in my respectful submission, that the court is bound to approach the matter in the same way, just because the same powers are available. But secondly, and really the main reason why I've drawn your attention to this paragraph is because we say it reveals the judge's underlying mindset, which is that he was approaching the matter as an application to set aside an objective finding of primary fact as at 2013. And he struggled to see the logic of applying subsequent events. We respectfully suggest that had the judge viewed the task he was undertaking through the prism of the correct analysis, he was being asked to review with the benefit of hindsight the soundness of the evaluation in 2013, then based on just the simpler parts of the factual matrix, those eight key facts I've identified, um, the answer would have jumped off the page to him without the need to, to descend to the granular level of detail that, 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 that the evidence did and that he did about whether the quality of the party's relationship came up to the mark. My lady and my lords will indulge me in just one, one brief hypothesis. It's as simple as saying, or I could say, Mr. Viney kicked me, that happened, he did it, he kicked me so hard I thought I wouldn't be able to go to work for a whole week, but we reconvene a week later and I have gone to work. Mr. Viney still kicked me, but the evaluation a week ago that I couldn't go to work is clearly unsound in light of what's happened. I realise that seems, when I say it out loud to my lady and my lords, a blindingly obvious way to put it, but... That, in my submission, passed the judge below by, that, that just the, 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 that simple task that he was, he was engaged in. It, instead, he became um, uh, rather bogged down in tracing the power of the court to set aside its own decree back to an era even before the advent of secular divorce. And in so doing, he focused on that pre-1969 case law, which was never concerned with evaluative assessments. Um, it never had that stage of the decree going to move on to the principles that should be applied in exercising the structured discretion. And we suggest that the principles um, to be applied can be derived from, firstly, the intention of Parliament, which in this context gives clear signposts and indeed requirements, and secondly, the decided cases, um, at the risk of saying it again, there's a crucial distinction between those pre-1969 and those afterwards, the intention of Parliament. The first important point which we submit the judge lost sight of is that the decree nisi is not a final order. It does not dispose of the matrimonial cause and the marriage is not terminated by it. Parliament intended for the basis of the decree to be left open and the, door, the court's duty of inquiry to continue right up until the pronouncement of the final decree. And we say that proposition can be derived from the plain words of the statute at section 1.4. That's in the authorities bundle, page 179. <clears throat> if the court is satisfied on the evidence of any such fact, as is mentioned in subsection 2, that's the adultery behaviour and so on, then unless it is satisfied on all the evidence that the marriage is not broken down irretrievably, it shall, sub subject to subsection 5, which is the two stages, which I'll address in a moment, it shall grant a decree of divorce. There is no proviso written into the statute that this only applies at the decree stage. A, a decree is a decree. Sorry, where were you reading from? I'm so sorry, my lady. It's, it's subsection 4 of section 1, yep. which is... Um, just near the top of page 179, if the court is satisfied on the evidence. It's the next section, um, subsection 5, which provides for the two-stage process, every decree of divorce shall in the first instance be a decree nisi and shall not be made absolute, and so it goes on, it deals with the timing. Of course, those six months were immediately reduced to six weeks and, and coming into force of, of the Act almost immediately. Um, so that's just about period of time, and it does not prescribe that the application of subsection 4 above it, having to be satisfied of the subsection 2 fact and irretrievable breakdown, should be different depending on whether the decree is nisi or absolute. 
It does not say, for example, and it would have been open to Parliament to include this, that the decree NISI shall be made absolute unless material facts are put before the court to justify setting it aside. It just doesn't say that. Um, but that, we submit, is the effect of the test my learned friends are inviting you to import at their paragraphs 42 and 43 of their skeleton argument. which is at page 108 of the appeal bundle. <clears throat> um, they say, if the parties have not colluded or absent material facts not brought before the court on the original pronouncement of, on the original pronouncement of the decree, it will be made absolute. And they couple this with their statement at paragraph 43 below that the court, they say the court's task on pronouncement of decree nisi and on an application to rescind it are fundamentally different. And they talk about the statutory duty of the court to establish the grounds at the first stage, but not at the second. They say that's simply um, an option to, for the court to permit relief. If my lady and my lord take what my learned friends say at paragraph 43, when they say the court's pronouncement on pronouncement of decree, the court's tasks on pronouncement of decree nisi and on an application to rescind it are fundamentally different and substitute for the words and on an application to rescind it the words on an application to make the decree absolute so that it reads the court's task on pronouncement of decree nisi and on an application to make the decree absolute are fundamentally different then the fallacy of that proposition in my submission is, is revealed for it's plain from the words of the statute that I've just referred my lady and my lords to that the court's statutory duty is not confined to the NISI stage. We do not agree that the court's task on the pronouncement of a decree NISI and a decree absolute is fundamentally different. And there's a further important point that emerges from the secondary legislation, which I'm going to deal with in a moment, that makes it particularly incorrect, if, if land friends could be particularly incorrect, to make that assertion in respect of all categories of cases. I'm going to explain in, in a moment the different procedural routes for applying for a decree absolute um, and the distinction between the court's task, depending on whether it's the petitioner who applies, whether there's been a delay, whether it's a respondent, and so on. Um, we find support for the statutory interpretation I urge on the court from the judgment of Mr Justice Payne in the case of Biggs and Biggs and Wheatley. Um, that's in the authorities bundle. It starts at page 148, but the passage I would like to refer to is at page 157. Paragraph F. About halfway down. My apologies if this isn't this is not a section that's marked. Sorry, what, what page again? Um, page, page 157, my lord, in the authorities bundle. Sorry, yeah. um, paragraph F. I mean, he's, he, he starts that paragraph by talking about the discretionary powers that were abolished. There, he's talking about condemnation and revival. But um, the, 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 the point I'd like to make in relation to statutory interpretation is about halfway down when he starts, in my view. Um, in my view, by reason of section 1.5 of the Act, it's quite clear that the marriage continues up to decree absolute. And he goes on and he repeats the word of the subsection that I've just taken, um, my lady and my lord, to. He goes on to say the period, of course, has been shortened. And he says the words in section 2.1, and there he's talking about the provisos in section 2 of the Act, um, the bar to adultery, uh, the bar to an adultery petition and the presumption against a behaviour petition and so on where there's been cohabitation. He's talking about those, th those bars, and he says they cover both the petition for decree nisi and the application for decree absolute. The petitioner is a party to the marriage throughout. The marriage continues until decree absolute. In asking for decree absolute, a petitioner is relying upon the adultery and the breakdown of the marriage and is still relying on section 12A of the Matrimonial Causes Act. In this case, read behaviour for adultery in section 12B for 12A. So we agree with Mr Justice Payne that the correct interpretation of the primary legislation is that Parliament intended the soundness of the decree to remain open to question right up until the pronouncement of the final decree. Uh, and um, 
whilst we're whilst we're talking about those provisos, section two of the Matrimonial Causes Act, they, they are in that appears at authorities bundle page 180. Supplemental provisions as to facts raising presumption of breakdown. These were the provisos with, with, with which Mr. Justice Payne was concerned in Biggs. We say they provide further support from the primary legislation that Parliament intended events post dating decree NISI to be relevant and subject to inquiry by the court. Um, that's the bar, as I say, to the adultery petition and the presumption against behaviour. But we say that those factors, are, they're plainly relevant because Parliament intended them to be so, but they're not necessarily the end of the matter when present. And the case of Court and Court, the 1982 case of um, the, the then President Sir John Arnold, <coughs> is, is, is a good example of this. The court still retains a discretion, not a, tr not, I should, forgive me, I should make a distinction on an adultery petition, the court does not really retain a true discretion because there's the bar, but on a behaviour petition, even where there's been the cohabitation for a cumulative period in excess of six months, the court still retains a discretion. It's not necessarily just the end of the matter. Um, we say that the very existence of these provisos, however, lend weight to our submission. Um, I turn now to the secondary legislation for... Um, Interesting to my lady and my laws, here's where things get really interesting. I'm not sure that secondary legislation is, is often described as such, but Parliament has drawn a distinction between the different procedures for decree absolute dependent upon which party is applying, whether certain conditions exist, whether there are circumstances that should be brought to the attention of the court, and the time frame. Firstly, there are those cases where it is the, 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 the petitioner um, applies by giving notice for the decree NISI to be made absolute. This is the relevant provision is rule 7.32, Family Procedure Rules 2010, in the authorities bundle at page 193, pages 193 to 194. Where it's the petitioner who seeks to have the decree made absolute, then subject to a series of provisos the procedure is by notice, which we characterise as a request to the court, not on notice to the other parties, as, to, as distinct from an application which must be made on notice to the other parties. And what that, what that um, provision says, that unless Rule 7.33 applies, and we say that's very important, um, this is a case where Rule 7.33 applies, I'm going to look at that in a moment, um, that's where... That's the provision dealing with applications, not notices, and prescribes that an application, not a notice, must be made in a whole series of instances, including where an application has been made to rescind and including where the application is made by the respondent. But just looking, um, first of all, at, at applications to which Rule 7.32 applies, subparagraph 2, subject to those provisos, where the court receives a notice, it will make the decree absolute if it's satisfied, and then it goes on. Um, to list a whole series of possible applications. That, that, that the court must be satisfied that there are no extant applications of that nature, including an application for a rescission of the decree NISI. In, in practice, um, my lady, my lords, that's a bureaucratic exercise undertaken by the court office. Um, in this category of case, the decree absolute, as Parliament intended, probably is just a rubber stamp in, in, in practice. Um, the decree absolute is turned around very quickly by the court office in a matter of days. There is no hearing because there's no requirement for the other parties to be given notice. The vast majority of divorces, the most common sort of procedure, will be this procedure we submit um, up and down the country. But that is where the rubber stamp, if that's the right um, way to characterise it, stops in, in, in my submission. Um, and we say perhaps this is this is the rule. Perhaps some learned friends have borrowed their test at paragraph 42, the will make absolute. Um, but what they what they fail to identify is that at best that can only apply in this category of cases within Rule 7.32. Parliament intended all other categories of case to be subject to some element of further inquiry and scrutiny, depending on the particular circumstances. And Parliament has invested the court with a discretion in all other categories of case. Um, even in cases being dealt with by notice under Rule 7.32, where the notice is received more than 12 months after the decree NISI, the court requires an explanation of those matters 
set out at Rule 7.323, and um, those are the matters with which the court's familiar, why the application hasn't been made earlier, whether they've cohabited, and whether a child has been born, um, and we say that the ad uh, adoption for, for for, for birth read adoption in the circumstances of this case. And even in those Rule 7.32 cases, it's at that point that the nature of the court's exercise changes from the mandatory will um, to an exercise of discretion because at subparagraph 4, it reads, where paragraph 3 applies, the court may, this is a requirement to file an affidavit, and the court may make such order on the application as it thinks fit. Not will make the decree absolute, simply an open question of discretion. As a matter of fact, in this case, um, was it said at any stage whether the applicant and respondent have lived together? Not, not in the ordinary meaning of the word, my lord, no. There was no... no... I mean, the, the, the appreciate they had, a, they had two, two homes and um, appear to have um, gone elsewhere together. Yes. Third places. Um, I mean, it may not matter for the purposes of the appeal, but is, is it obvious whether either before or after the decree I say this couple lived together or not? It, it, it is obvious, my lord. They, they, they n neither before nor after decree I say did they live together in that traditional sense, and that well, is. I know, but that's, that, that assumes that living together involved one house, and I'm, I'm, I'm querying whether that's um, whether that's the case. Um, the, that that was not the, that was not the, the the modus operandi of their marriage in in that traditional one house sense, my lord. No, they spent a number of nights per week together. What what the I don't want to stray into the disputed evidence. What was certainly found and accepted by the court was that there was no change from before yes, to I, after. I, I understand that, but I, I just as we're going to pass over, live together not yes. only in this rule but in but elsewhere. Um, w w whether there was some examination or assumption or finding made about whether this sort of arrangement where people have two houses but they move in and out of each other's houses as seems best to them and then um, uh, go to other places together, um, whether there's any reason that that might not amount to living together. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe it was, it was a point extensively explored in argument before the judge below. There was certainly evidence about, as I say, that there was no change from before and after, but the concept that a marriage has to gravitate around one matrimonial home. It's been it's been it's certainly been examined in other contexts, and and that that um, rather um, conventional, um, I suppose, objective assessment of, of, of the way a marriage is operated has been rejected in other contexts. It doesn't simply have to be um, living together. I mean, certainly the statute does talk about living together um, as husband and wife. I mean, it was perhaps because it was drafted more than fifty years ago that, that, that the concept was rather more conventional. Yeah, but they're different concepts. I mean. Reconciliation is one concept which has been considered in this case. And um, elsewhere, I think it's been said, well, one doesn't, doesn't look to reconciliation, one looks to cohabitation because it's easier to, it's easier to spot. But even cohabitation, or living together, whichever you call it, it is not necessarily a, a, a crisp um, no. a, a arrangement in a case of this sort. Well, well, it may be. Another example, if we go back to consider um, Lord Wilson's judgment in Owens, uh, yet another reflection of the changing uh, social mores, which this yes. court ought to be very conscious of, uh, because um, you, you, you yourself said unconventional relationship. But I, but I think, for certainly from my knowledge and experience in, in these cases, certainly in the um, context of more and more second marriages, it, it's, it's far more common than yes. it was when I first started in practice. Yes, in the early 1980s, uh, for um, couples who regard themselves completely and committed and married, yes. and living together to to continue to have two homes and to spend only you know, part of each week under the same roof. And, and I suppose, my lady, if, if they would definitely regard themselves as living together. Yes, and I suppose the concept that a, a, a finding of living together or for cohabitation involves in itself a degree of evaluation, a bit like reconciliation. That's an evalu That's an evaluation of the nature of the relationship. Cohabitation is an evaluation of the nature of the arrangements that the parties had. I mean, we say in this case, it's, it's the accumulation of all the different factors taken together, including the length of the delay and so on, and those eight, the eight key um, findings that I've pointed to that, that, that in aggregate undermine that original evaluation. 
the fact that Parliament uses the language live with, cohabit, and those provisos at, at, sub, at, at, at section two of the Act, um, it doesn't mean that the court's confined to... to, to well, I, I think my intervention was only to point out that um, the, 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 the rule does not say live together in one property. My lord, no, and I, I, I respectfully would adopt that as something in, in support of the submissions that we make, that, that there, there's no constraint. Parliament did not in, intend that constraint to be, to be imported. Mm. Um, so, so I return to my um, submissions that 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 at, it is at this stage, even when at Rule seven point three two three, when there's been a delay, that the court's discretion is engaged and the rubber stamp um, stops. Um, in our submission, these factors are really important when we come to our critique of the test that Mr. Justice Moston formulated and the factors that he considered necessary or determinative to weigh in the balance because he singularly failed to address himself about why the application for decree absolute had not been made earlier. Um, if I can ask my lady and my lords to look at paragraph 60 in his judgment, which is at page 61. No, it's not. Forgive me, that's, that's the... Sorry, can you say the paragraph number again? Um, I'm just, I've just given... Um, the old one. My Lord, my one Lord a duff reference. If you just give me one... It's, uh, it's, it's, it's paragraph 60, page 61. It's, at the very top, it's, it's it, in the appeal bundle, it's paragraph 60. Um, and the, the, the part I'm interested in is... That to me is very <coughs> five lines down for reasons that have not been explained for 12 months after the pronouncement of the decree but before the reconciliation the wife did not apply for the decree nice I wouldn't have been able to be an absolute that delay is very puzzling and he goes on to say in November 2014 she and the husband resumed a toxic damaging and an unhealthy relationship and he goes on to stray into what we say are his um, illegitimate um, assessments about the quality of the relationship that paragraph is the only reference to delay in the, in the entire judgment. And in our submission, it's clear that the judge was not satisfied as to why the application had not been made earlier within the 12 month time frame indicated in the legislation or otherwise. The explanation by the wife for the ongoing delay after that was that she'd resumed her relationship with the husband. And more than that, her explanation was that she did not believe the marriage had irretrievably broken down. Um, she says so, it's not necessary to turn it up, but she says so in her statement at page 141 of the appeal bundle, paragraph two. The judge also fails to address at all the husband's explanations for, for the delay, which are, we say, um, informative. Well, isn't, there a, isn't there another reason for the delay in relation to the obtaining of the financial order. I'm not sure I follow, my lord. Yes, the, 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 I may be misunderstanding something. The decree now says November 2013. Yes, September, my lord, yeah. Is it September? I, I believe so. I may... All right, well, I'm just reading off the chrono chronology. <laughs> um, so, um, give or take the chronology. Sometime at the end of 2013, there's a decree now signed. Um, and um, there's a final financial order made in June and sealed in December 2014, according to the chronology, right? Yes. Right, so is there some, is, does that play into why, why there is no decree absolute or is it nothing to do with it? I, 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 I don't really say, my lord. It is, it is uh, it's fair to say, um, pretty common practice um, for, for final decrees not to be sought until the finances, finances have been sorted out. There's no requirement for that. Um, but that would not explain in any way the delay, the exceptionally long delay that followed then from the end of 2014 to 2022. No, but, but when you're looking at judgment, paragraph 60, and the judge being puzzled by there was no application within the year, um, during that time, presumably, a lot of attention was being given to finalising the finances. 
Um, I, I, my lord, my lord is, is right. Um, although that wasn't that wasn't canvas. That wasn't that wasn't. I, th I think equally peering over my lordship's shoulder, <laughs> his screen. <Yeah. laughs> um, the financial remedy order was um, June, and it's very commonplace, isn't it, for decree absolute to be sought or, or immediately after the making of the financial remedy order. So that would yes. be within the twelve months, yes. whether it's November or September. Yes. The previous year, the decree not. And what's more troubling about this paragraph and then the absence of any other reference to delay in the judgment is it's not so much that initial 12 months, but the exceptionally long yeah. period of delay of afterwards. Um, but if I can ask my Lord and my Lady just to take for one moment to turn to the husband's explanations for the delay, because I'm going to go on to submit that <coughs> all these explanations, had they been properly addressed, would inevitably have led the judge to a different conclusion. Um, firstly, at page 138 of the appeal bundle, which is the husband's statement in support of his application for decree to be made absolute. And I'm looking at the fifth bullet point down. He explains, I have not previously applied. Just a moment. So sorry, my lady. Page 100 138. Page 138. Thank you. Fifth bullet point down. Um, I have not previously applied for the decree now I to be made absolute because I did not feel ready to extinguish the final legal tie remaining in our relationship. <clears throat> he says, as well as my own feelings, we had two children together, I didn't want to rock the boat. So it's plain in my submission from the husband's statement that he valued the status of marriage. If I could also um, ask you to go to his second statement page 167 of the appeal bundle is paragraph 14 sorry I have to keep 168 my lord thank you 167 forgive me 167 paragraph 14 the paragraph where he says to the outside world I liked to call Angela my wife for a number of reasons Firstly, I hope that by describing her as my wife to be more likely to reconcile with me, I had no desire to distance myself from her. Secondly, it was the easy way to get her invitations to glamorous events to which I was invited as a Palestinian newspaper publisher, including with the Trump family. Having this status was particularly important to Angela, and I saw it as a route to winning her back. Bearing in mind the extracts that I've just read out, which are all explanations for the delay, we submit that had the judge properly addressed his mind to requiring an explanation, it would inevitably have led him to the conclusion that the application had not been made earlier because the marriage had not irretrievably broken down. But the judge just ignored that, we say, but and instead not engaged... Really ignored it, he said it was puzzling. That, well, forgive me, my I lord. There was no, no indication of what he meant by that at all. Um, in my submission, his, his, his puzzlement is confined to that initial 12-month period. That's what he says at paragraph 60. No one made an application within the 12 months. I find that delay very puzzling. He may, he, I, I suppose he may have been puzzled by the other delay too, but, but, but my central submission is that he didn't satisfy. If he was puzzled, self-evidently he wasn't satisfied of the explanation that was given. So, so insofar as either he ignored it, or if he didn't ignore it, he didn't, in my submission, satisfy himself of the explanation, explanations by both parties for the delay. Instead, he engaged in a different and wrongly, wrongly formulated evaluation that the parties had a, a highly defective marriage and so on, and did not achieve a reconciliation. Um, the next procedural category of cases for turning a decree in eyesight into an absolute are those to which Rule 7.33 applies, that I mentioned um, a little earlier, and those are the ones that must be made by application on notice as opposed to the by notice procedure available to the petitioner. Um, those are in the those provisions are in the authorities bundle, page 195. And my lady, my lady and my lords will see that the conditions, an application that must be made, conditions at, at subparagraph two, are either where the Queen's, now King's, proctor has given notice. Secondly, where there are other circumstances which ought to be brought to the attention of the court before the application is granted. The, the instrument 
um, there's nothing on the face of the instrument that prescribes what those other circumstances are, we suggest that that's likely to be a reference um, to the matters set out in Rule 7.322 and 3. In other words, where there are extant applications, such as for the rescission of a decree, that's 7.322, or in circumstances of delay, that's 7.323. Um, but, but as drafted, it's actually very, it's actually very broad. But then a friend say in their skeleton argument um, on, the, on, the, on the black letter of this rule that those 7.323 matters requiring explanation do not automatically apply where an application procedurally is, procedurally is made under this rule where there's a respondent applying. And we say that as a matter, we say it in writing too, um, even, if it, even if it's not to the black letter of this regulation required, um, it must surely be is must surely be matters to which the court should have regard in exercising discretion. Um, so a again, the court has a discretion because these are cases where it's the respondent applying, and indeed, what happens up and down the country in cases where a respondent applies for decree absolute, the other party is given notice, the court fixes a hearing. Um, almost certainly, in the vast majority of cases, nobody actually turns up. But Parliament has decreed that the procedure is thus, and this reinforces my, probably my central submission that I advanced to the court, um, that this, that this um, procedure on decree absolute remains open and the constituent elements um, must be tested. And we say that the test my learned friends urge on the court that test at paragraphs 42 and 43 of their skeleton, of their written argument that I took my lady and my lords to a moment ago. Um, that, that test must simply be wrong, save for, in that slim category of cases, although like to be most, most numerous, um, to which Rule 7.32 applies, and the application is made by the petitioner by notice within 12 months. That's the will. <clears throat> so just drawing those strands together, if I may, before turning to the decided cases, if we're right for the reasons I've explained, that Parliament intended the court's duty of inquiry to continue right up until the pronouncement of the final decree. Um, and, and if we are right about that, and the court has a statutory duty to examine the basis of the decree before pronouncing it, then that exercise in our submission must surely be carried out by reference to the Owens three-stage test, the elements of a decree, um, as set down by the Supreme Court, as we've argued in our written presentation, and that have informed the way we suggest the test should be formulated paragraphs 23 and 24 of our skeleton argument. I don't think you're submitting the court has a general duty to inquiry. I rather understood your submission to be that the uh, elements required for a decree to be made have to uh, remain in existence to the date of the decree in eyesight and to the date of the decree absolute. Yes. And your submission, as I understood it, was more that if the soundness of the decree, so the elements of the decree, um, is brought into question as a result of the circumstances being brought to the attention of the court, um, then it's the soundness of the decree, the elements required to justify the making of the decree that have to be analysed my lord, yes. I mean, the, the, the point about the sort of foray into the different procedural routes is, is my London friends, I don't think they describe it as such, but they effectively make a sort of floodgates argument. They say, well, this, this would just cause chaos. And in fact, it wouldn't, because procedurally, the vast, not the vast majority of cases don't invest the court with the discretion, actually, because they're the Rule 7.32 route. And, and those that do, there's good reason why they do. Um, because Parliament intended it thus, because, because there's been an application for rescission or the King's Proctor is involved or there are other circumstances. And so once the soundness, as my, as, as, as my Lord has correctly identified, becomes open to question, um, <coughs> rather than it being um, a sort of Ladd and Marshall um, set aside of a primary finding of fact type test, which I'm going to, in, in a moment when we look at the authorities, explain that that's how the judge um, formulated his test, it is to look at those constituent elements once again. And in fact, um, that was the way that Mr Ewins framed the question in the court below. Um, my lady asked for the, for the skeleton arguments, and, and, and in fact, he does address that question, that we're looking back at that constituent element, the, the evaluative assessment as at 2013. Is it still right in, in light of those subsequent events? 
I hope that answers my Lord's question. Um, I'm going to turn to the relevant case law and address what principles can be derived from them. We've supplied your ladyship and your lordships with a composite authorities bundle. There are seven authorities dealing with applications to rescind a decree or similar. I'm going to run through them to the extent that it's of, of, of assistance um, to explain the following. The point I've already made, that the cases decided before the Divorce Law Reform Act of 1969 are of limited utility to your ladyship and your lordship because they were decided in the context of the different divorce law regime of matrimonial <coughs> defence. Therefore, necessarily, they don't address the subjective elements now requisite for a divorce under Section 12B. I say now, I mean, they're, they're under the law of... Uh, 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 <coughs> The cases decided since 1969 all approach the exercise of discretion in the way that we advance, namely by reference to the building blocks of the decree. In some of the cases, the judge exercised his or her discretion to rescind, and in some not. But the essential exercise with which they were engaged was the one we are urging on the court in this appeal. Um, I'll take them in reverse chronological order, if I may. The case of Durant, upon which Milan and Friends um, place a great deal of reliance. It, it, it wasn't referred to by the judge below. I don't know whether it was cited to him, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, because Durant has absolutely no relevance in my submission. It was decided by the Ecclesiastical Court, the Court of Arches, in 1824, before even the advent of civil divorce in 1857. And before the introduction of the two stages of decree, uh, the nice line, the absolute, in 1860. So the first obvious difficulty in relying on Durant for anything is that it was concerned with the set aside of a final decree of divorce, which we say is materially different to the exercise <coughs> the court is engaged with when deciding whether to pronounce the final decree in the first place. It's also fundamentally irrelevant because, like all the other pre-1969 authorities, it's based on the doctrine of matrimonial offence. There was no subjective element. And in fact, in Durant's case, like so many of the pre-1969 cases, they were involved with, with applications to set aside findings of primary fact. In Durant's case, the husband applied to set aside the decree based on his adultery, and he made the application for him to bring evidence out of time, which he asserted was relevant to the allegation. Um, it wasn't new. It was known to him at the time of the original hearing. So not very surprisingly, in my submission, the court gave judgment in the terms set out by Milan and Friends a paragraph 50 of their skeleton applications of this nature for obvious reasons are seldom succeeded to. But um, it's completely different to this case and um, need not trouble your ladyship and your lordships um, further. Just remind us, um, was this case quoted to the judge? I, I, don't, I don't believe so, my lord. It certainly doesn't appear in either party's skeleton. It doesn't appear in the, ju in the judgment. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there in the court. Right, so, uh, I'm not, this is not a criticism, but it, 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 I couldn't find it in the judgment. And... Um, <laughs> um, where it might have been expected to be found. Um, but um, it doesn't matter. It, it seems to come in now in the argument before us. That, that it's it's well, only because Milan and Friends plays, plays a great... In fact, they place so much reliance on it. They say, this, this is the case. Everything else, you, n nothing has changed since then. This is, this, is, this is the case and everything follows. And so that's why, my lord, I've, I, I've dealt with it to, to, to dismiss it. Um, next, the case of Moore, which was decided in 1892, so at least within the period that the courts had the power to dissolve marriages but nevertheless under the old law of matrimonial offence. In that case, the wife had petitioned based on the husband's matrimonial offences of cruelty and adultery. The offences were approved, the decree nisi was pronounced. Um, subsequently, in, in fact, it probably doesn't matter, but for, for the purposes of the, of, of, of the um, lack of weight, I say, should be attached to the decision. In the interim, the wife, believing herself to be divorced, had gone through another form of marriage with another man, and then he'd then died. And then subsequently, she resumed her cohabitation with the first husband, he committed cruelty towards her again, and seven years after the decree nisi, she applied to have, on her own petition, that decree nisi made absolute. So the issue before the court, that was Mr Justice Goral Barnes in the probate division, was that the wife had condoned the matrimonial offence upon which the decree nisi had been pronounced. She'd forgiven, she'd forgiven the offences by her resumed cohabitation with the husband. As your ladyship and your lordships will recall, under the old law, condemnation was a bar to relief. It was a subsequent event which acted as a, as, as a bar, but it did not render the initial decree unsound. The matrimonial offence had still been committed. And that's why, in this case of Moore, the court ruled that the husband's subsequent cruelty revived the former matrimonial offence. 
Or put another way, condemnation as a bar was always conditional upon the perpetrator not committing a further matrimonial offence. And that's fundamentally different to the exercise engaged in this case, because under the old regime, it was only necessary to establish the objective matrimonial offence. Um, uh, under the old law, the initial matrimonial offence could be revived after condemnation because it did not take away some intrinsic piece of the original decree. Once there was a repeatable offence, it was, it was revived. Now, under the law operating on this appeal, those subsequent events where they show the subjective or evaluative consistent constituent parts of the, of the decree to be unsound cannot be discarded as irrelevant, even in a case where the marriage has later, for different reasons, irretrievably broken down again, because in contrast to the old structure, the subsequent events under the current law have destroyed the very basis of the decree itself. Um, so with respect to the judge, when he was considering these historical, um, uh, the development of the court's power in these historical cases, he, he failed to appreciate this fundamental distinction in, in my respectful submission. Um, Mrs. Justice Parker and Kim and Morris, one of the other cases um, to which we referred, um, my lady and my lords, did note that distinction. Um, just for your note, she said so at paragraph 54, at page 90 of the authorities bundle. She says, I do not consider that the old law with regard to condemnation, revival, and so on comes into play. It's been replaced by the provisions of the Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, the last well, of the... Where, which paragraph was... In Kim and Morrison. That Morris is um, paragraph 54, my lady, of Kim and Morris, which is at page 90 of the authorities bundle. Thank you. The last of the old law cases is Owen and Owen, the decision of the divisional court in 1964. And this is the case upon which the judge below placed so much reliance in formulating his, the test. In fact, he cited it at paragraph 33 of his judgment. 52, where he says there are many authorities on the exercise of this power, but in my opinion, the most illuminating is Owen and Owen. And he then, in his judgment, goes on to reproduce the extract from the judgment in which Mr. Justice Scarman, as he was, talks of the justification of a rehearing being the public interest and so on. This was a divisional court decision. Yeah. My Lord, yes. Um, it, it, this extract that the judge reproduces. It's plain in my submission that's where he derives the second limb of his test, that the judge's test is at paragraph 44 of his judgment. And he talks about the court needing to be satisfied about material facts, but he says as a second limb, he says that the court will need to be satisfied that the degree of error is such that to allow the decree to stand would be so contrary to the justice of the case that the serious step of setting aside an order made by due process of law is justified. But it's here in my submission that the judge falls into serious error Owen was not just decided in the completely different legal regime, but also the facts when scrutinised were, so very, were very different. Um, in Owen, the husband had petitioned for divorce on the grounds of the wife's cruelty. There was some to and fro that doesn't really matter, but in essence, the wife, on advice, chose not to defend and cross praise. So the decree nice I was pronounced on the husband's petition. Within a matter of weeks, the wife changed her mind and applied for a rehearing and she wanted the opportunity to defend and cross prey on the basis of alleged cruelty and adultery by the husband. In Owen, the wife was, uh, was asking the court to set aside its order, not because of subsequent events, but because of facts known to her at all times during the hearing of, uh, of the cause, and she had simply changed her mind about bringing them to the, to, to the judges, to the court's attention. The language of public interest and contrary to justice emerges in this case because it was the wife's only argument to seek to persuade the court to set aside its order and allow her a rehearing, um, because she'd had every opportunity to put <coughs> these points the first time round. And my lady and my lords can collect this from page um, 163 in the report. Does this uh, report set out what the relevant uh, provisions were for a divorce um, at that time? There was certainly, give me my- What was the relevant act at that time? I might have to turn to Mr. Viney just, just, <laughs> just to double check that. The 1957 matrimonial Thank clause, that my lord. Um, I mean, I say, I say that's in the head note um, to that at page 160. Um, that's the matrimonial clause's rules, 1957. So. 
I just wonder what the the because you're you're saying uh, for reasons that I understand, speaking for myself, that the old cases that we're dealing with a different legal structure and regime. Yes. But I just think it'd be interesting to know what the what act was in force at that point. Well, in time. what the provision was that was being considered and what it did and didn't have compared to what. But our purposes, the Matrimonial Causes Act had. Um, I wonder if I can do it this way, my lord, that, that Mr. Viney will find that. Right, thank that, you. that is precise. But what, what I can say with confidence is it was before 1969, and of course it was that. Yes, you can. It's 1963, <laughs> we know <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> that <does>. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Viney tells me it's, it's the 1937 Act. Thank you. Which is reproduced at page 100. There's a reference to it at page 165. We can certainly have the lunchtime. Well, that comes, from, that comes from a quote from. From winter, um, so I, I think, think that needs checking. Um, my lord, yes. It, I, mean, it, I, I, I can't remember what, when winter was decided. It's um, 1942, so it may well have been different. So there might have been another one. Um, we, we will, if we if we may deal with it in this way of the lunchtime agenda, we'll make sure that Thank we have you. the particular. Um, <coughs> um, what the, the, what I was um, addressing, my lady and my lords, in relation to was how this language of public interest and contrary to justice mm -hmm. of the case emerged in in in. Um, Owen, not to be confused with Owens, and that can be um, collected from page 163 in the um, <coughs> authorities bundle, where it's noted um, the beginning of the, of, the, of the second paragraph, one Margaret Booth for the wife advanced the argument the court must have regard to the public interest in matrimonial matters and see that decrees are granted according to the justice of the case. So it was really her argument that would otherwise have been hopeless, one can only um, uh, presume, to set aside a, 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 the decree for reasons um, that were known to her at the time, she simply hadn't brought them, I suppose, like, a, again, a Ladin Marshall type, type, type situation. Um, and that's where this language of public interest creeps in, and in my submission, the judge misconstrued that and, and held it as an extra requirement as opposed to a reason why matrimonial matters um, should not have been should not have been addressed. Uh, unless my lady and my lords would like me to, I don't, I don't propose to read out great swathes of that, of that case. There. Well, um, the, the, there's in, information in this report which um, you might want to consider. I'm just looking, for example, at the bottom of page one six eight. Um, and I'm not sure. If one reads the paragraph that begins conscious mm. that we have a discretion, um, there's a reference there to the public interest on questions of status being determining, determined on true facts. It's also alive to the unwisdom of allowing orders obtained by due process of being likely set aside. Um, there wouldn't seem to be anything objectionable the fact that for, however the court is going to exercise its discretion in this sort of situation, it's going to want to bear in mind, isn't it, um, the first consideration that the question of the status are decided on the basis of true facts. Um, and, and also um, that if one's considering setting aside an order, um, one's going to want to consider the nature of the order in question. And one can think of orders that are more fundamental than a green eyesight, but there aren't many of them. My lord, no, and of course the difference between a final order and the inchoate first stage of, of, of yeah. the character. Green eyesight is a very particular sort of order, but it's, um, colloquially, it's a big one. <laughs> um, and that's going to be a consideration that the court is going to want to also bear in mind. Um, it is, my lord. All I would say in relation to, to um, the importance of what's said here is that it must be borne in mind the context of which yes, it was being advanced. It was, it was, it was, exactly, that it was a, it was an entirely different sort of situation where, it, it, in essence, the wife was trying to get out of something that she'd let pass very shortly before. And there was nothing subsequent. It wasn't that the facts even became subsequently known to her. No. But in this case, the facts hadn't even happened until subsequently, so they couldn't have been brought before the court. In this case, she could have and should have brought the matter before the court. She had, I mean, there was some discussion in the report about whether or not her legal advice was sound. Um, she just decided not to, and she changed her mind. And, and, and that's why the, the hurdle for a litigant to surmount in that 
circumstance. I, I agree with my lord that, that that's that, that's a very serious matter, and uh, I've, I've made a couple of references to Loudon Marshall. It's, it's it's that sort of test. It's that sort of um, uh, approach. But in a case where, which is um, which is which is different, a case where subsequent events can and we say should inform an historic evalu evaluation. It's 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 a different exercise with which the courts in, is engaged. Um, certainly the way in which Mr. Justice Mostyn required the appellant to surmount the hurdle that not only did she, did she have to show that the material facts had, 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 were not before the court, but that also it must be contrary to the justice of the case. We say that that was not a legitimate um, way, to him, way to collect the principle from the case of Owen. Um, so, so we do say, as I was just um, uh, in my dialogue with my Lord, Lord Justice Jackson, not only in this case, which is a world away from the case of Owen, my client just, it wasn't just that she didn't know, those subsequent facts didn't happen. The resumption of her relationship, the adoption of Jay, the continued presentation as husband and wife, including, and the, and the factors include, the sheer elapse of time. Can I, sorry to interrupt. Can I no. just go back uh, to what my Lord, Lord Justice... Jackson uh, was discussing with you, so going back to page 168 and over on to 169, I, I think that what you are submitting is that you accept completely the principle that says um, that it's a serious order that has been made, uh, the court must be circumspect in exercising its discretion to set aside such a serious order. Uh, and amongst other things, it's going to be aware of the public interest in finality and all those other things. Yes. I think what you said, that you accept the principle I do. that's been drawn to your attention. What I think you are submitting is that where uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn went wrong was that, that he then elevated that to um, his second limb. Yes. Um, by effectively then by reference to a wholly different set of factual circumstances when he drew out from page 169 uh, where he said that there we are not persuaded that the decree obtained was contrary to the justice of the case or that there's grounds for supposing it would have been different. So you're saying that was then lifted out to become um, an elevated principle that's exactly what I'm saying, my lady. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Coupled with, just before we leave, leave it, the, the, the difficulty with using any of these pre-1969 cases. Well, we, we know you, your you, point. I've made, that, I've made that point. No, you're saying, actually, none of them help at all. Uh, but if we are inclined to, you would say, indulge in an analysis of them, um, That's they, the they, 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 they wouldn't be of any help anyway. That's exactly. I'm very grateful to my lady. Um, so I'm now going to come to the, the cases that were, de were decided under the relevant legal regime and from which... In <coughs> Sorry, can I just stop for a minute? Those, that passage that my lady just drawn attention to, if, for example, uh, somebody uh, has failed to put in their answer in time, sometimes I think there are certainly post 1969, post yes. 2000 cases that say in deciding whether or not you give leave, you take into account whether or not uh, the grounds supposing uh, that the uh, decree was obtained contrary to the justice or that the outcome might have been would have been different. So there might be circumstances in where that's... It still uh, applies. It's, it's a relevant approach. Uh, I would agree approach. with that. I, I, but you're saying not in... Well, not in our case. N not in our case. And, and of course, one could see that, uh, yes, in terms of an answer, to dispute the, the primary fact, I mean, the, wh whether or not the behaviour took place, that, that might be an element. E e even, um, I suppose, um, the court's evaluative assessment um, at the time that the respondent had behaved in such a way and, and so on, if they were facts already known to the respondent before the decree in ISI, what what... What's so very different about the, the circumstances of this case, and I, and I know my lady and my lords have this point, is, is that it was that exceptionally long delay, the events happened subsequently, and it's this um, concept of 
taking actual knowledge of subsequent events to inform our historic evaluation. And, and, that's, and that's, as I say, the point that we submit the judge struggled with and failed properly to engage with. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to um, the cases in the modern era. Um, firstly, in 1977, the case of Biggs and Biggs and Wheatley that I've already referred um, my lady and my lords to, um, that's the case in which Mr Justice Payne decided that events occurring after the pronouncement of decree nice I were just as relevant to the pronouncement of decree <coughs> absolute. Um, and the process by which he reviewed the matter in deciding whether to grant the decree absolute or not, and therefore whether to rescind the decree absolute was, we submit, um, consonant with the way in which we advocate should have been applied in this case. Um, firstly, he, having rejected the argument that events post-dating decree nice I were not relevant, he reviewed the soundness of granting a decree in light of all the facts now known to him. Um, and that's plain from the passage in his judgment that starts at 158 in the authorities bundle. <coughs> Forgive me, I've got a glitch. At the top? I, I believe it is, yeah. uh, yes. Um, but he well, says there seem to me exactly, my lord. Th say. Thank you, my lord. It seems to me two reasons, and he talks about firstly that as at the date of the application to decree absolute, the petitioner is still relying on the fact. In that case, it was section one two a fact, um, and, he, and he goes on to talk about the living together in, in the circumstances of that case. And in other words, he's reviewing the soundness of the decree in light of the constituent elements of the fact. It's section one two a in that case, and he goes on to say. The other reason is that the date of the application for decree absolute, it is impossible to say that has been irritable breakdown. Uh, Milan and friends point to this factual distinction compared to this case. In other words, in this case, <coughs> the marriage had not irretrievably broken down again. It was accepted that the marriage, um, that, that in this case, the parties had reconciled. But the important point to note in my submission, this passage, is that the judge says there are two reasons in that case why the decree should not be made absolute. And this reflects the basic proposition that the court needs to be satisfied of both the fact um, and the elements of the fact and the irretrievable breakdown. The final point to make in relation to Biggs um, is this. Milana friends say, well, that was an adultery petition where the proviso under Section 2 was engaged, so you can more or less disregard it because the judge didn't really have um, a discretion. He was bound to um, rescind the decree. Um, I mean, I accept that the facts were different. I mean, the facts always are. Um, but it does illustrate the process, process the court should undertake in my submission, whether in an adultery or a behaviour case, which is to examine the soundness of the decree by reference. In any case, it would only bite on the first of the two reasons given by the judge. M m my lord, yes. But, 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 but we say that the way the Act operates, both the fact is pleaded and it will break I understand break that, but, you, but even if Mr Mullins' point is well made in relation to the first reason, it doesn't touch the second reason. Agree, my lord. Um, the next case, um, chronologically next in time, although slightly out of order in the in the reverse chronological order in the bundle, is Court. That is at page 124. This, I've referred briefly to this to this case um, already. This is Sir John Arnold, the president. Um, This was a behaviour case, and it was a case where, notwithstanding a, a delay of a year and ten months and cohabitation for a period significantly in excess of six months, the court nevertheless did grant the decree absolute. I'm going to let friends again point to this a case um, as, as, as being against me, but the, the important point of my submission in relation to this authority uh, firstly, is that the, the proviso in a behaviour petition under, under Section 2 is not the end of it. The judge still has a, has a discretion. At the heart of the argument in that case was the operation of the presumption under Section 2.3 of the Act and how the court should and in what circumstances it would exercise its residual discretion to, gr to grant the decree, notwithstanding the presumption. Um, ultimately, on the facts of that case, the president um, exercised his discretion in favour of granting the decree, um, but in doing so adopted the approach that we advance. And, and the relevant part of his judgment is at page 128 in the bundle, <coughs> paragraphs A to C. Um, 
chance, my lady, my lords, to, to, to read that part. Okay. <clears throat> and then it says ultimate determination, which is the marked section on page 130. I know that I've just asked my lady and my lords to, to, to read that, but if I may just emphasise that the important part of that paragraph, because it informs us of the approach, is line seven, where he says, in a case like this, middle of the line, in a case like this, the same considerations as would have moved one to conclude upon the reasonableness of expecting the spouses to live together had one been dealing with the case at a decree nice-sized age under section 2.1b. So, in other words... Sorry, this. I've lost you as well. <laughs> Where, um, where are we? With the seventh line down. Page. Okay. Page 130. Oh, in the moved on from 128 then. Yes. It, it, it's, forgive me, my lady. This, this is the, this is the um, his ultimate determination. Yeah. And I'd ask you to pay particular attention from line seven in a case like this. Sorry, incident. seven lines down from where? From, from it therefore follows. Okay. Um, so, in other words, this is the same process for which we are advocating um, on this appeal, namely that when exercising the discretion at absolute stage, the same process has gone through, the same boxes need to be ticked um, as at NISI stage. Um, so, in my respectful submission, what begins to emerge from these authorities is that they do not support the learned friends when they say, as they do in various places, including at their paragraph 95, page 117 in their skeleton, they say that the court is not required to undertake the Owens test at decree absolute stage, and that it's confined to decree nisi stage only, and we say they're wrong about that. Um, the next decision is the case of Savage, a decision of Mr Justice Wood shortly after court in 1982. Sorry, when you say not required to undertake the Owens test, is that overstep? That overstating your position. You're, you're not saying the court has to go through the whole exercise again. What you're saying is whether uh, subsequent events undermine the exercise that the court undertook or draw into question the soundness, as you say. So it's not, you're, you're not a, a repeat rehearing. Unless So necessary. you're not reapplying the Owens test. You're seeing whether un anything's arisen <laughs> to undermine the findings, inferences drawn. Yes, my lord, yes. I suppose that the, 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 the nuance to that that we say is important is that that's done by reference to those constituent parts of the decree okay. as adumbrated by Lord Wilson in, in Owens. It's not a mechanical, not necessarily, although although in, in practice, I suppose, if the soundness of the decree well, has been called into question. We're not question. the reverse engineer, are we? The original petition and the... No, no, my lady, but where the, where, but where the question under review is um, if one of those constituent elements is now being undermined because of subsequent events, that question must be viewed. Well, you have to identify what the constituent elements are before exactly. you decide yeah. whether or not they're, yeah. there's science exactly. is called into exactly. question. And, and I, I suppose the, the, the importance of, 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 of the Owens test <laughs> is, that, is the emphasis on the subjective element, and that, we say, was lacking from Mr Justice Mosson's consideration. Because Lord Wilson says it's, it's not just objectively was the effect such that she could not reasonably be expected to live with him. An intrinsic part of that is in light of the subjective effect upon this particular petitioner. And we say that was singularly lacking from the judge's consideration. But all, I mean, that, that's only a second matter that needs to be looked at. The, the, the main question that's going to affect um, a decision of this sort is whether the marriage had irretrievably broken down. So, I mean, once one gets into the weeds of subjective this and objective that and so forth, I mean, it, it really, the, the main discussion is likely to take place at the 
at the earlier stage in the case of this complexion? Um, uh, yes and no, my lord, if I can answer it in, in, in this way. Because, that, because only the constituent elements, the factors pleaded and irretrievable breakdown have to be present for a decree, any decree to be yeah. pronounced, it's, it is logically possible for the marriage now to have broken down irretrievably and that to be sound. It is theoretically possible for the marriage as at 2000, 2013 not to irretrievably have broken down, but the fact has pleaded to be proved, although, as we say in our skeleton, that would be a feat of mental gymnastics. The two really go hand in hand at that stage in 2013. So, so it is, but the reason we, we focus, in a sense, in our submissions upon um, our um, uh, attack of the fact as pleaded is because now we do have irretrievable breakdown. I, I, does that make sense to my Lord? I'm not, I'm... Well, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that I'm wondering how many obstacles you're putting in your own path <laughs> um, here, that, that if, at, your, at its very simplest, um, your, your case, I understand it, is that fair enough, um, any any sensible judge might have thought in 2013 that this marriage had irretrievably broken down. There was going to be a divorce, and so matters got to degree nice eye stage. Um, but your essential submission to us, I understand it, is that any sensible judge would see nine years later. Um, but that's not how things happened, and that it turned out that the marriage, in fact, hadn't irretrievably broken down. Um, and your your appeal, as I understand it might succeed on that basis alone. I mean, I'm not seeking to prevent you from adding arguments to it. No, my, my lord, I suppose that the, the difficulty is, and, and this is a theoretical possibility, because I, in my submission, if the marriage had not irretrievably broken down in 2013, then inevitably it also meant that it was reasonable for the petitioner to continue to live with the respondent. Because of what uh, Lord Wilson and, and, and Lady Hale say in in Owens about there not needing to be a causal link between the factors proved and the irritable breakdown because there's a later irritable if one of, if, if one or other of them is missing, then it's no divorce. Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose we're saying at 2013 they were both missing in, in retrospect with the benefit of hindsight. There was not irritable breakdown and the factors pleaded was not proved because it, because it was... I'm, I'm, I'm really offering you the opportunity to, uh, to correct my thinking that um, even if... Uh, was established that the person in your client's position could perfectly well live with somebody in the respondent's position. Um, the, the fact that the marriage had so demonstrably not irretrievably broken down over a sustained period of time involving children and everything else, um, it of itself would um, call for the a decree to be set aside. Um, my Lord, yes, I suppose I... I you don't I, have I, to prove everything in reverse no. order. Um, you, you just have to prove that there's something fundamental about the decree which cannot be allowed to stand in the light of subsequent events. In terms of rescinding that decree, I suppose, my Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging my bets in a sense because now the marriage has irretrievably broken well, you'd, have to, you'd have to prove something different if you, take in, if you start another petition. I appreciate that, but you yes. have no difficulty in that either. And that, and that is the intention of the appellant, my lord. On, on it, it just seems to me that when one gets to the discussion, which you're going to come to about um, a subjective effect on the petitioner as well as the objective facts that have been shown, um, that those are not the main plank of the argument. Um, they're, they're, they're a, you're, it's a follow-up to the, your first point. The, the reason, my lord, that, we, that we've argued the case in that way is because that be, because of this delinkage in the act between the fact and irretrievable breakdown. So even if irretrievable breakdown later comes for a different reason, if the fact as pleaded is 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 not open to to, to is is not susceptible to being set aside. But your argument on the first one is that it's not just to hold somebody to a previous irretrievable breakdown, which has been shown not to have been the irretrievable breakdown but to insist that the later irretrievable breakdown is subsumed in the earlier one. It's not just to do that because of the unreality and, and also the consequences of doing so. Um, I, I'm not understanding at the moment why mm -hmm. one has to get also success on the, the, the underlying ground. It, it, it may be some of assistance, my lord, if, if, if we look at the case of Savage, because that was precisely the situation that arose in that case before Mr Justice Wood. There had been a behaviour petition 
and a decree in ISI, subsequent events showed that the, that the fact, as pleaded, was no longer proved, but there was later irretrievable breakdowns. So it may, may be of assistance. Yeah, but I'll, I'll get out of your way, but having raised it, it yes. needs to um, come back at some stage. Yes, my, my lord, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, the, the, the case of Savage, um, the decision of Mr Justice Wood, exemplifies, we say, the correct uh, um, approach and should have been followed. The key question in Savage was, as, as um, we've just been discussing, whether the inference originally drawn that the wife could not reasonably be expected to live with the husband was the wrong inference looked at in the light of the circumstances now, now known. The relevant sections in the judgment are the marked sections at pages 136 and 137 of the bundle, the authorities bundle. B to C that you're really asking us to look at. Um, I'm, uh, but, 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 and also D right down to the, to, to, to the end of G. Um, that, that paragraph G, my lord, um, addresses the point that we were discussing a moment ago. Sorry, are we on 36 or 37? 136 or 137. You're on the 137. Uh, be, before we go, the, the, the submissions being made on behalf of the Queen's Proctor exactly. included. Uh, reconciliation to be encouraged. Yep. Is that still a feature? Of, when I say still, I don't know what the position is under the 2020 scheme, but is that still applicable to this case? Um, my, my Lord, yes. It's one of the, the public policy um, arguments that, that we raise in writing. Um, um, we, um, we don't um, particularly seek to add anything to our public policy arguments that we've made in our skeleton, but we adopt them. That the, the whole the whole scheme of the sweeping reforms that came in after 1969 were intended to promote reconciliation, that the, the long title to the Act, um, if nothing else, and, and, and the Law Commission reports that, that, that the Act was born of, and that, that this um, idea that, that giving new life to a stale decree is antithetical to um, encouraging reconciliation. Um, I mean, in fact, in, in this case, Mr Justice Wood goes on to... to, to Raise the question that you know, after two years a decree nice I should lapse because it, that that stale the threat of a stale decree being held over the head of one party to the marriage um, was not um, consonant with this with this public policy of reconciliation. Could could we just consider what might be quite a subtle distinction? But looking at Mr. Holman's submissions at letter F, yes, on, on one three six, yes. Um, the test he proposed was whether the inference drawn by the court originally from the facts that the petitioner cannot reasonably be expected to live with the respondent was still justified in the light of subsequent events. Yes. And so that is not quite the same as what the judge says at letter D on the following page, namely the wrong inference. I mean, <coughs> the wrong inference makes it look as if one is, as it were, he hearing a late appeal from something in the light of subsequent events. But that is, it seems to me to be a long way around to doing what the court is um, more probably doing, as it seems to me at the moment, um, which is <coughs> to see whether the, um, the inference drawn from the facts is still justified. And although Mr. Holman was referring to the reasonable expectation element uh, one could easily substitute the irretrievable breakdown I agree with that, my Lord. element, and that it might be said um, to be clearer to consider this as being still justified or not, rather than w were they right or were they wrong, because my, they clearly were right. My Lord, at the I time on the basis of what they had. Couldn't in, agree in more, all my Lord. Of these cases. I, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't agree more, my Lord, and that's why we say that the nature of the exercise, which is why I took my Lord, my Lords, and my Lady to, to the primary <coughs> legislation. Um, at, at the beginning of my um, submissions to underscore this 
principle that the duty of inquiry does, do, do, does continue up until the pronouncement of the final decree. It doesn't mean that in a mechanical sense, in the vast majority of cases, it's going to, it's going to ensnare district judges up and down the country with extra work, because in most cases it won't apply. But, but it, is that still justified? Because, because it's not a final, it's and, not a final this order. This makes more sense of having later acquired information. Um, because it's not a question of saying were they right or were they wrong. It simply was the conclusion that was reached. Still justified. Continue to be sustainable. Yes. And, and in a sense, then the burden shifts. And, and in our submission, that's that's part of the difficulty with the way Mr. Justice Mostyn approached <coughs> it. He 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 required the appellant to surmount a very high hurdle, rather than looking at it from the other end of the telescope, as my lord um, has rightly identified. Um, but if I, just, just pausing there, my lord, I, I did um, uh, promise that I would use this case to help illuminate the point that, that we were discussing a moment ago. Um, and that's the difference between um, the inference that it was not reasonable for the petitioner to be to continue to expect to live with the respondent and then um, irretrievable breakdown. Because if we're looking at whether those evaluations are still justified in light of subsequent events, now that we sit here, or as Mr. Justin sat there in 2022, um, the, the twin pillars for a decree are necessary. The fact has pleaded an irretrievable breakdown. Events subsequent to 2013 show two things, we say. Firstly, that there wasn't irretrievable breakdown in 2013. Secondly, that there wasn't, secondly, that the inference, the inferential evaluative assessment that it wasn't reasonable for the wife to live with the husband also wasn't correct. But I suppose, my lord, subsequent, subsequent events show that the marriage has now irretrievably broken down. So that is an evaluative assessment um, that's still justified by the court in light of subsequent, subsequent events. But what can never be remedied is that by reason of the factors pleaded, and, that, and, that, and that's what, that, that, that was really what happened in, in this case of Savage, the factors pleaded um, could, could no longer support an inferential evaluation that it wasn't, wasn't reasonably reasonable to expect the petitioner to live with the respondent as a result of that behavior even though subsequent, subsequent events had shown the marriage was irretrievably broken down. For my part, I think it's getting too hung up on the fact that there was a subsequent irretrievable <laughs> <laughs> Well, but Speaking for myself, I don't see the difference between the two. Okay. I mean, I, they, they, they stand or fall, I would have yes. thought they stand or fall together. Because if the marriage is resumed for six months... It was not irretrievable. Yeah. If it was resumed for 20 years, yes. then that might have a different um, impact on the question as to whether or not the inferences drawn at the time were or were not uh, correct. So it's, it can be relevant, but it's not, um, it, it's, I don't see how it could be determinative. Well, I, I mean, I certainly don't want to make things more difficult for, for, for myself. And, and, and um, I suppose if, if my lady and my lords took a different view about those component elements, I would nevertheless say that because the factors pleaded, didn't give rise to that inferential evaluation, even though the marriage had later broken down. Um, but, but, but I take the point, and, 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 and indeed that's the way we, we put it in writing. The marriage had retrie perhaps one could say the marriage had retrievably broken down in 2013, but subsequent events show that it was not irretrievable. Rather torturing language, but. Um, um, so uh, there were just three points I wanted to. Um, draw my lady and my lord's attention to in in word, not just that I suppose it's my star case and that Mr. Justice Savage, that Mr. Justice Wood did what we say the judge should have done in this case, but also um, the case, um, as my lord, Lord Justice Moylan has already identified, refers to the important matter of public policy, that reconciliation was to be encouraged. And also at paragraphs B and C at page 137, uh, the judge um, rejected the argument that the court should be engaged in examining the quality of the cohabitation. I'm not convinced that's the correct approach, he said. I, and, and we say that's relevant because, because that's what the judge ends up doing in this case. He, he, he looks at the quality of the party's relationship. Um, well, he, he, he's, it's not just he says we don't do quality. It's, it's the living together that must be examined, is what he says. Um, that, that, this was the reference that mm. I mentioned earlier on when we were talking about what does living together mean. Um. Y yes, I mean, in, in my submission, what, what, what we can um, collect from this case is, is that the judge is engaged in looking at, at, at really 
not at the granular level of what's going on in, in my submission. The judge is looking at some, some really sort of overarching points, the, the points that hit the judge between the eyes, if, if I can put it that way. Um, and those are points that in this case pass the judge by, those eight key facts that I'm going to return to um, in my submissions. Um, in terms of the, the other case, or SNS is about rescission of decree, but we say it's not really of any um, assistance in this case because that concerned rescission by consent. That was that, that was those are the that was the case where Mrs. Justice Singer was being asked to rescind the decree by consent so the parties could take advantage of the Welfare Reform and Pension Act reforms. And finally, there is the case of Kim and Morris, Mrs. Justice Parker's decision, which we submit is also supportive of the approach that we advocate. Um, that was an adultery case, and the parties had lived together for four years after Queen Isai. Um, and so much of the judgment was taken up with whether cohabitation engaged the bar under Section 2 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. And unsurprisingly, the judge followed Mr Justice Payne and Biggs and said that it did. But the judge also considered that, that um, she, she considered that in effect she didn't have a, a real discretion because of the operation of the bar. But she said, um, Obiter, that if she did have a true discretion, then she'd have regard to the reasons for the delay and, and, and so on. I don't think I need to take my lady and my lords in particular to that case, um, unless you'd like me to. <clears throat> so, so drawing all those strands together, um, we repeat our submission that these authorities support the proposition that the exercise the court is engaged in is to examine whether the basis for the decree has been undermined, to see whether those evaluations are still justified, um, my lord, in, in, in light of subsequent events. And if we're right, um, then we return to the simple proposition that the court's engaged with looking at those constituent elements in the way that the, the, that the Supreme Court in Owens has prescribed. And that's why we've set out our suggested correct test, which is at paragraph 28. I don't propose to go over that and repeat it. We, we adopt what we say um, in writing. It's set out very fully. The matters I, I'm moving now to the correct test, um, my lady, my lords. The matters I propose to address are the points taken by my learned friends against me in their skeleton argument at sections E and F, where they say... Um, Can we just... Could you just situate us in the bundle for your correct test? Page. Yes, it's pages 88 and 89, my lord. Paragraph 28 <coughs> of our skeleton. <coughs> well, this is a much more... I mean, uh, your, your, your correct test goes on for a page, um, more than a page. Um, what's wrong with the uh, summary that you've just given us? My Lord, nothing save that um, in assessing whether the inference is still justified in light of subsequent events. In my submission, um, the, the court must have regard to, must, must, must perform that exercise in the way that the Supreme Court in Owens prescribed, namely, what is the subjective effect on the petitioner um, of the behaviour complained of, uh, and so on. It's 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 breaking that. But that, that, that 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 involves, as the lady has put it, um, reverse engineering of what you need to get into a divorce in the first place. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that what you need to do to get out of a divorce is to step back through exactly the same steps as stages that you had to go through to get into it. Um, I mean, clearly, aspects of the situation which would have been relevant to granting or not granting a decree nisi are likely to remain relevant at a time deciding whether to rescind or to make absolute the decree. But why does one need to structure it in this, um, in this way? Surely it's a much more high-level evaluative exercise of deciding, is this right? Is this fair in the light of all the relevant features and none of the irrelevant ones? Um, is it, in other words, is this old decree nisi the one on which the marriage ought to come to an end? Yes, but I suppose, my lord, that the devil is in the detail. When my lord said, is it right, looking at all the relevant factors and not at the irrelevant ones, that, that, that it's the way in which that question is framed and whether or not the subjective um, perspective of the petitioner is weighed in the balance yes, or not. You're saying, for example, that in, in your eight factors, we go through them all one by one, but none of them got anything to do with a lot of what's on this. You're, you're, you're relying not on 
particularly subjective factors, or anything of you're just relying on basic history, aren't you? Yeah, yes. You're relying on the subsequent events. Well, the subsequent events which are not, I, not seriously disputed. No, but, my lord, I'm also relying on my clients, which I'm going to come to, subjective evidence, which was, I did not believe this marriage had ever truly broken down. Uh, because because, because well, you, that... You, you, you want to go one step further and say that, that if she says that, that's that. Well, that was uh, the and, first... And that, I mean, that, that may be problematic, um, speaking for myself. Yes. But um, you don't need to um, do that, and certainly not in this case, on your own analysis, namely that there are certain things that are so big um, in what took place subsequently that it's obvious that the earlier decree is not, doesn't fit. That is what we say. P p partly, we also say that because the petitioner's evidence of the subjective effect on her was credible, because it was believed, the judge never said he didn't believe her, he found her to be a credible witness, that he should not have discounted that in arriving at the conclusions that he did. I mean, my Lord is referring to um, Mr Molyneux's criticism of my test, which is um, that, that the petitioner could rescind the decree on her ipsy dixit. That, that's, that, that's, his, that's his criticism. Well, isn't, doesn't your, at some points, your, your argument comes quite close to saying that? Um, Namely, that the court can't um, can't say to somebody, um, "I disagree with your subjective view of things." Um, there's an important difference, my lord. What I'm saying is, the evidence must be credible that she could um, reasonably be expected to continue to, to to live with the respondent. I mean, I mean, the I mean, the literal meaning of ipsy dixit is is it's just on her say so. It's got yeah. to be credible. I mean, she can't say something ridiculous, something that's so obviously not true. But in this case, the judge never disbelieved my, well, certainly never addressed it in his judgment, he never disbelieved my client's evidence that she believed the marriage had not irretrievably broken down and, and, and by extension, therefore, the, uh, the, the subjective effect on her of the husband's behaviour was not such. But can't the subjective element be, be part and parcel of an examination of subsequent events? Yes, my lady, absolutely. So, that, so I'm, I'm just struggling to see why it, it, it wouldn't in any event be part of any judge's analysis so the judge would say, this happened, that happened, the other happened, and, and they each believe that to be Yes, my, my lady, we say it would, it, it should be, but it wasn't in relation to this particular judge's analysis. Yeah, well, uh, well, we're not at the moment. We, I, I didn't think we were at this particular moment looking at what the no. judge said. With great respect to Mr Justice Boston, we will, of course, yes. do that. I thought we were looking at what the test is and how we should apply it. Yes. And I think what my Lord is saying is, are you not going, making it far too complicated if we go, if you ask us to go through this sort of structure and is not actually the heart of your submission uh, that you assess if the inference remains justified in the light of subsequent events and you remind the court as part of your submission that analysis will include having heard evidence and taken into account the subjective yes. uh, views of the parties. My lady, yes. And it's then turn to say, but I don't, but if you apply my test, Mr Justice Mostyn fell into error. Yes, and my lady, it's like the very last, last part of what you said, the, 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 uh, forgive me, I, I paraphrase, but taking into account the subjective effect on the petitioner, because that, because that is the way when the Supreme Court came to look at what's necessary for a divorce, that, that it's not just the objective evaluation by, by the judge. It, that, that an intrinsic part of that, I suppose, is, is, the, is the subjective effect upon that particular petitioner. But it might not just print, this is the, the, we're, we're grappling with this at the moment because it's not just to do with, does it make a difference in this case? It's to do with the conceptual way in which one approaches this. And you say the subjective effect on the petitioner. And I'm thinking, well, what about the subjective effect on the respondent? That, it essentially, as my lady has put it, is the court not concerned? <coughs> this is what happened. This is what she says about it. This is what he says about it, why they were doing these things. And it's like a game of consequences. And the consequences were. Um, and you have to take into account all the factors in deciding whether to set aside or make absolute a decree nisi. Um, and it doesn't just revolve around what's going on in the petitioner's head. Um, that, that's one of the important factors that will explain to the judge why these things happened and they didn't just go straight on to decree absolute. But it, it would be leaving out the view of the other party if one was to privilege um, what was in the mind of the petitioning party. Well, we'll say that, my lord, that, that's how the Act is framed. It's, it, it, it's, well, it's no, the, act is, the, the Act is framed in that way in terms of getting a decree. It's not framed in that way in terms of getting out of a decree. 
Well, save it if I, it, but, but in my submission, the question should be looked at differently. It's not simply getting out of a decree, it's asking for the decree to be made absolute. And that's why at section 1.4, Parliament hasn't made a distinction about the elements that the court needs to be satisfied of between a decree nice and a decree absolute. It's simply the pronouncement of a decree, and it would have been open to Parliament to say, well, these, these are the constituent elements the court must be satisfied of at decree nice stage. But you're not asking the same question because being time has passed. That you're, you're, you're not comparing like with like um, in, in terms of what happened back in 2013 and what the situation is in 2022. Well, my Lord, in a, in a sense we are, because it's still on this petitioner's petition. It's still her application. It's still her that has to prove, which is why the, the, the nonsense of a petitioner saying, I, know, I no longer think that, I'd, li I'd like to withdraw it. Of course it's got to be credible. And in my submission, that is probably where the respondent's evidence comes yes, the in. Credibility is, surely, as my lady said, one element in the evaluation overall. But if you're going to seek to say it's a knockout, yeah. that's more difficult. Um, but but the, 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 the difference between uh, what my Lord is suggesting and what I'm submitting is that I, I, I don't agree that, it, that, that, that the respondent's <coughs> subjective viewpoint is, 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 is relevant to the essential question. Of course, it's, di it's different because he's, because he's um, not the petitioning party. I understand that, that the act um, has, has, has a particular resonance for, the, for your client's um, position. But the evidence given by the respondent as to what they were there and why they were behaving in this way is going to be very important as well. Um, not in terms of what the court has to be satisfied under section 1.4, because the court has to be satisfied of the fact as pleaded and a irretrievable breakdown. The parties can get divorced for different reasons, of course, later. Well, well you've just answered my lord's question, because the court has to be satisfied of irretrievable breakdown. So yes. part and parcel of seeing whether the um, a degree absolute, if it's still justified in the light of subsequent events, will be a decision whether the... Um, there has in fact been an irretrievable breakdown and, and what the respondent has to say about that will, will undoubtedly in fact be a feature that the judge is duty bound to take into consideration. Uh, yes, but I, do, but I don't shrink from the proposition that the fact as pleaded also has to be an essential ingredient. What, what, whatever's happened... What, what exactly do you mean by the fact as pleaded? The fact as pleaded, I mean that the respondent has behaved in such a way that it is unreasonable to expect the petitioner to continue to, it, 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 that such that it is unreasonable for the petitioner to continue to live with him. That's an essential ingredient yes. as well as irretrievable breakdown. And that, and, th and that is why in Savage, the decree ultimately failed because that fact is pleaded, notwithstanding irretrievable breakdown for other reasons, fell away. And, and that's why my submissions focus so much in relation to what, and, and that is something that uniquely the petitioner is in, a, is in a position to give evidence about. It does go hand in hand. I entirely ex accept and absorb the point that that goes hand in hand with whether the marriage was irretrievably broken down as at 2013. But but it's not the because because the act requires both branches of the tree, both you know both elements that also must be found to be proved. And and it is in relation to that infer inferential evaluative part of the section one two b fact that it was such that it was not reasonable to expect to continue to live with him. That is where the Supreme Court in Owens has specifically directed the test to be applied in a mixed subjective and objective way. I don't know whether that answers my lady's question, but... Um, but that, I, I, I know what your submission what is saying. anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, um, that rather deals with um, the flaws identified. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to just run through those... Um, it leads me then to the judge's test and what he did, what he did wrong and why it was wrong. Um, the judge, the judge sets out or what he's turning to the judgment. Now. Yes, my lady, it's a paragraph <coughs> forty-four. Um, the judge sets out what he says as his test at paragraph forty-four. <coughs> um, he 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 sets out his two limbs: the material facts existed at the time, or that they've subsequently. Have occurred which furnished the clear conclusion, the findings made or inferences drawn by the trial court were making the decree nice and were not justified, and then he sets out a second limb. I I've, already, I've already addressed you in relation to the second limb, I'm not going to go over that again. His first limb is, on, on the one hand, difficult to fault per se, but we <coughs> accept that when considering to rescind a decree nice side, the court's engaged with considering whether there are facts that furnish the conclusion that the inferences drawn were wrong. But where the judge's formulation falls short is for what it d does not say, um, 
does not say when considering those questions the courts to engage with the constituent elements. We say that, that, that of course, that may not necessarily matter, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, of what this court said in Fahe and, uh, and, and so on. But it's only when we travel, in my submission, to that part of the judgment where the judge applies his test or purports to apply it, that's it that, he, that its deficiencies are revealed. And worse, we say the judge, in fact, applies a different test, his own standard of a functioning marriage, his own test of the quality of the parties' relationship, and his own definition as to what constitutes a reconciliation. Um, we don't accept that the, that, that, that the judge concluding there was not a reconciliation was a finding. We say that was an evaluation. That was an evaluative assessment in itself. Um, the, judge's, the judge's actual decision is contained at paragraphs 57 to 60. That's at pages 60 to 61. <coughs> These are the um, operative, the most important um, paragraphs. We well, do you want to say anything about 47 48? I realise your, your time is short. but uh... um, um, in, in relation to the credibility of the, uh, of the <coughs> cases, yes. my lord. Um, yes. yes, insofar as I didn't do a moment, a moment ago, I, I made um, passing reference. The, the judge never found that my client wasn't telling the truth. He found her to be a credible witness. She was by far the better witness. Her evidence was generally clear. Um, well, would you not, do, you, do you submit that the judge went too far in dismissing the quality of the evidence? At paragraph 48? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have to. I'm not. I'm not really sure what the judge means by this paragraph, Milady. I, 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 it seems to con uh, contradict. I think, it, I think it's part of a. It, it, it's an another case where he's expressed his Personal. strong views uh, that demeanour is effectively yes. has a little has little relevance. And when I say I don't, I don't understand what he means. I don't understand how that can fit with what he says at paragraph forty-seven. Either some, I, either the judge assesses a, a witness to be credible um, or, or, or not. Um, I, I think what he's saying is, even though the, the husband did not present as a particularly credible witness, I, I can ignore that because demeanor may not be the end of it. I, I, I'm not sure, in terms of my appeal, um, all, all that does. He certainly does not ever disbelieve my client as a credible witness. Um, so it's, what, would it not have an impact on whether or not that there should or should not have been a, a finding um, that there had been the parties had resumed living together uh, after decree nice and that, that he accepted her evidence that that was the case and um, you would say her subjective view that this was a reconciliation it's a point I was go, go, going to come on to make not, not just that it was a reconciliation but her subjective view that the marriage had not irretrievably broken down I was go, going to go on to highlight to my lady that, that one of the deficits one of the things he doesn't address in his judgement is, is her evidence he, do, he nowhere does he say I don't believe that I don't accept that, that still less does he explain why and, have, and having observed what a credible witness she was um, it, it's, it's, it's one of the deficits that we point to in his judgement and the way that we dealt with it so if, if that's what my lady means, then the, then the answer there is yes. Um, we say that the that probably the most important paragraph in the judgment was what the judge says at um, paragraph fifty-eight. Well, you passed it in fifty-seven. The judge uh, found uh, as he described. It, that it was always a highly protected marriage. So what he there seems to be saying is that the nature of the marriage, uh, what, what he might be saying is the nature of the marriage before 2013 was the same as the nature of the marriage between 2014 yes. and 2020. It, is that what he's saying? Uh, we, w that is what he was saying, that it, th th that it didn't change. He certainly doesn't demarcate that change. Um, in any event, we say that that... Um, Assessment that evaluation it was a highly defective marriage. What, what does that mean? That that's introducing the judge's own um, personal value judgments. We say um, illegitimately into, into his assessment about what was going on. Um, what I he does. The point, the Lord, Lord Justice uh, 
of Moreland's making is that effectively what the judge was saying, well, this was a continuation, business as usual. It, it Actually, it could have been an absolutely lovely marriage that they had a, a bit of a glitch and then carried on back to being lovely. Um, but in fact, it was a he felt a dysfunctional marriage which carried on being dysfunctional, but it was no change. My lady, yes, and that, and, and that was a large. That was the way in which the case was argued on behalf of, uh, of the appellant at, at trial, and, and that was accepted. And that goes to the point that I made earlier: the parties had never lived together, in, in whatever that means, um, before or after. There was no change in the in the way that they operated, if I can put it that way. And 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 that does um, endorse that. Um, I just wanted to take one step back and and address the issue that the judge never never rejected my client's subjective evidence, never explicitly rejected it, that the marriage had irretrievably broken down. She, she said that in, 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 her, um, in her statement. What he says in relation to irretrievable breakdown is to be found at paragraph 57. He simply says that as at, he says on, on 17th of October 2013, the court rightly found that the marriage had irretrievably broken down. Well, he's saying that as at that moment in time, that was the right conclusion. He's not, re he's not reviewing it in light of subsequent events. Um, the only other place that he deals with this is in, the, in his conclusions at paragraph 60, the concluding sentence, I'm completely satisfied that at all times following the decree, their marriage was and remained irretrie irretrievably broken down. A glitch. Um, but he's not saying that because he's reject by reference, let alone rejecting my client's subjective evidence that it had not. He says that by reference um, to his evaluation in the preceding sentence in that paragraph, which was that the relationship was toxic, damaging, and unhealthy, which had none of the qualities of marriage, <coughs> which cannot be described as a marital relationship. The judge's reputation. logic, which um, we see in these paragraphs, is that the marriage um, had irretrievably broken down at the moment that it was um, celebrated. My lord, yes, he 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 didn't he didn't. Um, I can. I mean, your 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 um, your essential submission, as I understand it, is that even when one was, was to look at paragraph fifty-seven on its own, is that it's a perverse finding. It, it's a perverse finding, and it's and in fact, but what it, in fact it is, uh, they are evaluations by, by him. It, it's not a primary fact was there a reconciliation. It's how he has evaluated the primary facts as he found them. Um, and we say that, that he did that by reference to some objective standard about what a marriage is or what a marriage should be. And unless there's any doubt about that, 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 that he uses reconciliation as some shorthand, um, he, we say he doesn't because at paragraph 57, he addresses um, what he says the constituent elements um, of a good marriage are. He talks about enjoyment of each other's society, marital comfort and assistance, solace and satisfaction. Well, they are they are precisely the sort of external objective metrics which would be very susceptible to changing social mores, I, I, I suggest, and, and would not stand the test of time, and are illegitimate within this context. Um, I, I said to my lady and my lords that I would um, uh, comment upon the eight key facts um, that I have highlighted. Um, much of the time, I'm, I'm going to do so very briefly, if, if I may. And I say it's important because, as, as, as you know, I'm inviting my lady and my laws to exercise your discretion afresh. afresh. So by reference to that, um, to that table, because we say the fact, the fact that the judge dealt with these, either, either that he didn't deal with them or he dealt with them in the wrong way, reveal uh, the very serious errors um, in his final conclusions. Um, fact number one, that Jay was adopted um, and treated as a child of the family. All that the judge says about this is at paragraph 57. And he says, the treatment of Jay as a child of the family with the consequential acceptance of financial liability is very virtuous, but does not, in my judgment, lead me to conclude that it's a functioning marital reconciliation. So he refers to it as, a, as supporting his evaluation that there was not a functional marital, marital reconciliation. But had he considered this undisputed fact properly, he would, we say, inevitably have reached the conclusion that his arrival and treatment by the parties as a child of the family, consensual treatment as a child of the family, and cast out on the, the soundness of the original inference and the original evaluation that the marriage had irretrievably broken down. He never should have omitted to consider that factor, we say. Secondly, as I've already addressed my lady and my lords, he never properly addresses delay. He's never properly satisfied as to the reasons for delay. 
The third fact, there was a finding that the husband was violent prior to the petition, but none afterwards. He doesn't address the absence of violence post-dating the decree nicely at all. In fact, that was the appellant's case. That, that, was, that was the main change, that before the petition, there'd been, there'd been uh, incidents of violence, and afterwards it was never repeated. We say that was significant, because from the wife's perspective, that was the most serious behaviour pleaded. Uh, fourth fact, he doesn't um, address the fact that there were sexual relations for five years after Decree Nysai. The only place in the judgment he refers to, to, to that at all is in his earlier discussion at paragraphs 45 and 46, in which he opines that a marriage may um, function without it. The same point could be made in relation to holidays. It was simply not addressed. Um, the judge does refer um, at paragraph 57 to the fact that the parties referred to each other privately and to the world publicly as husband and wife. Now, I suppose this is linked to, to, to the status, the idea of status in, in the eyes of the outside world. He refers to it, but he doesn't, he doesn't assess it correctly um, in our submission. He assesses it against his own objective metric of the quality of their relationship. And he says, while they may have referred to each other and to the world as husband and wife, and he goes on, there's no enjoyment of each other's society, no mutual solace, and so on. And we say that those were inappropriate um, considerations. Um, seventh fact, the fact that the parties were drawn back together. Um, he, he refers at paragraph 57 to the fact the parties were drawn back together, but he fails to ask himself the right question, whether this subsequent fact, with the benefit of hindsight, undermines that 2013 inference and evaluation. Uh, and third, he goes on to again to apply that fact to his own evaluation of whether there was a marital reconciliation. But he, he says that um, it's an abuse of language to describe it as a marital reconciliation, um, but he doesn't say what you can describe it as. What, 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 I suppose one could pick up clues from his mutual society comfort solace and, uh, and so on. But, but it, what, what, yeah. I mean, one might think that if um, if this was such a big issue, I mean, query whether reconciliation is the right test. We said, yeah. to be applying anyhow, but one might, one might think that um, uh, if, if you were going to say, well, this isn't a reconciliation, um, one might uh, say, well, what is it? What are the hallmarks of reconciliation? What no, is no, 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 no. no what, 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 was, what was going on? Yes. Oh, I see, my lord. Yes, the, the, the other part. He, he doesn't ever address that. What he, he says, it, he, he says it's, it's, it's a toxic, unhealthy, and damaging relationship. But, but the real difficulty is the very concept of what is a reconciliation is, is riddled with value judgments in my submission. And it, and, and it is for that reason very susceptible to changing social mores, very susceptible to um, the individual perspective of the person making that evaluation. Um, and that if, if one were, I mean, one can see in a wider context that if, if on this appeal, my lady and my lords um, decide that that, that, that that is the test, and these are the hallmarks of a reconciliation and so on. One can readily see in other contexts, such as the financial remedies context, parties arguing, well, we weren't really together within the meaning of a reconciliation. Our relationship was pretty rubbish. We didn't do this, but we did do that. It's, 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 very, it's not the right question to ask, we say, and that, 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 because it's not by reference to those building blocks of the decree, because that's, because that's the only um, ordered and, and disciplined way to go about it. And it is an evaluation that's simply not explained. I didn't think you needed the building blocks of a decree in order to describe a relationship. There are ordinary words that will tell you it's a, it's a close relationship, it's an arm's length relationship, etc. The, the, the difficulty, my lord, is, is, is what the judge strayed into. His, no, his... I'm not disagreeing with you no, with, 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 with the, the, the submission that you're making, but you, you, you keep coming back to the building blocks of the decree, which is what um, led me to. My lord, I, I, right. You're I, on number eight now. I'm on number eight, which is simply the fact there was no. Co this is a point we've canvassed um, yeah. previously. I'm, I'm not going to. So we submit. Had the judge addressed all those factors, inevitably he would have come to a different conclusion. Um, the, the the. So what did the judge find out about this? You've given us quotes from 61 and 63. Yes. So what? So actually, my lord, this this fact that there was no cohabitation before or after was never addressed at all by the first iteration uh, of the judgment in draft. And you'll see that, um, rather to the judge's um, ir irritation, Mr. Ewan's raised it as a, as a point um, uh, arising under material emissions. Is it paragraph 63, little three? No, it's not. Little two. Um, 
we say this was significant because there wasn't a change, as was as one of the points that my lady and my lords uh, have, have picked up on. And um, it was after Mr. Ewens raised the fact that the judge failed to refer to it that he did amend his judgment to make it clear that they didn't live together permanently, they would spend an average of three nights with him, and of course they'd go on lengthy holidays together. The, he, he, he had earlier said that the husband vehemently denied um, spending two nights a week. Um, Trenchantly disputed they spent as much as two nights a week, top of um, he never, 53. He's, but I mean, is one to presume from the fact that um, he's very complimentary about your client's evidence um, that one must assume that he actually found that your client's yes. account was correct? Yes, and, and there is, I've, Mr. Bynum will give me the reference. In, 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 when he's assessing the credibility, he points to a particular lie that that that, that, that was uh, the husband was um, revealed to, to 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 a perpetrator, which was about not having keys. There, there was a lie right. about having keys, yeah. and obviously that goes to sort of living together. So whilst he doesn't explicitly say, "I find on the balance of probabilities that they did spend on," average. instead he said, it, it, "It doesn't matter that one one witness is um, a very good witness and the other witness is terrible." Well, I suppose, my lord, that's why I say I don't really understand what the judge no, is saying. That paragraph might might have been devoted to saying. Um, that he accepted the evidence that your client gave it on matters better. that were of any importance. My lord, yes. With paragraph 47, the reference to the keys. Um, so so um, I, I said in my opening remarks that I was going to say that where that leaves us, and so far as I haven't already addressed the court in relation to it, um, I, I, I have. I, I've, invite, I've, I've highlighted those eight key facts um, that we say um, my lady and my lords can apply to the correct approach in law. Um, I'm simply going to conclude by saying two things. Firstly, that Mr. Viney has found the answer to my Lord's question. Um, it was the, the night he, he and Mr. Bennett agree that it was the 1950 Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, <coughs> Substantively repeats the relevant provisions of the 1937 Act for these purposes. We can make the statute available if necessary. Thank you. And yes, please. Um, if my lady and my Lord will forgive me for one moment, I'm just going to turn my back to Mr. Viney. Those are my submissions. Thank you very much indeed. Perfect time. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Very well. Um, Ms. Wong, you will hear what you uh, have to say this afternoon at 2 o'clock, please. All right.